I didn't try to kill myself because I was sad. I tried to kill myself because I wasn't allowed to be sad. I tried explaining this to mom on the drive to Twin Pines. I said it was like having birds trapped in your stomach. When I cry, she tells me not to cry. When I complain, she tells me not to complain. When I whine, she says stop whining. So the birds just flap their wings and keep knocking into my organs and I feel really, really bad. I looked over at her. She was sorting through her audiobook CDs. They were in a leather case on the sun visor. She looked over when she noticed I was staring at her. You say something, dear. I felt the birds stir. I turned to look at the trees. These weren't Manhattan suburbs, side of the highway shrubs. These were Northwest, Jersey, scrape the sky kind of trees. When I looked at Twin Pines on a map, it was covered in green. There were barely any roads. One road in, one road out. A river running through the center. It was the middle of nowhere, a nothing town. But that's what mom wanted. No more things, no more problems. Mom finally picked a CD. It was one of her stupid goddess strength audiobooks. The narrators were always grandmas. After my incident, mom started playing them more and more. Maybe she thought they would make me want to kill myself. Less. Quite the opposite. As the grandma talked about how faith was like a trust fall into God's arms, I thought back to the night. In my defense, my suicide attempt was heavy on the attempt. As soon as I took the pills, I regretted it. I felt really guilty. I didn't want mom finding me dead. So I ran into her room and immediately puked on her carpet. She gave me the dirtiest look. Don't you know how rentals work? She said. That was the last thing I remembered. I woke up two days later in a hospital bed. My hair still smelled like puke. In a way, I thought mom would be happy I didn't full-blown kill myself. But, no. Instead, she thanked me by packing up everything we owned and moving us to the middle of nowhere. She found Twin Pines in a book she borrowed from the library. It was called America's Sleepiest Towns. Twin Pines was number one on the list. With three pages of colorful pictures to go along with it. Not that it needed them. You could capture Twin Pines in a single picture. A main street with a dozen antique shops. A backdrop of two hills with abandoned ski trails running through them. An overgrown front lawn. That pretty much captured it. At least our old town had character. It didn't matter that it was squished between three highways. When mom pulled into our new driveway, she reached over and grabbed my hand. Welcome to our new life, she said. Smiling. I looked ahead. There was another family in the driveway. Mom's smile quickly went away. What in the... They were throwing trash bags into the back of their station wagon. There was a mom, a dad, and a little boy hanging on the dad's leg. The parents were hippies with long hair that curled down to their butt cracks. As we parked, the couple seemed to get nervous. They packed faster. We stepped out of the car. Hippie mom waved, but didn't look at us. I felt the birds claw at my stomach. I didn't like being the person taking away this family's home. The little boy didn't seem sad, though. He let go of his dad's leg and walked towards us. He had those big, blue eyes that, for some reason, made me nervous. The color reminded me of a frozen lake. Look out for Lisa, the boy said. Mom crossed her arms over her chest. It was her signature move before a talking to. Excuse me, little boy, she said. We'll be out of here soon, the boy's mom said. She was trying to squeeze an acoustic bass into the back seat. Mom gave her a thumbs up, then turned back toward the town, leaving me alone with the boy. He kept standing there, looking at me with those pale, blue eyes. She likes to walk across the lawn. She? I asked. The boy's dad dropped a bag and walked towards us. He held out his hands in surrender. 
L-Y-S-S-A, he said. His voice had a bounce to it. Lisa's the Greek goddess of rage and madness. Jake and I are very into mythology. Are either of you fans? Mom turned back to face me. She rolled her eyes, as if we were thinking the same thing. We weren't. Marjorie said we would have the house by 10 a.m., Mom said. It's 10.30. Do I need to call her? Hippie Mom finally squeezed the bass into the back seat. She slapped some dirt off her dress and walked over. Marjorie's right across the street, ma'am, she said, pointing behind us. Why don't you go over and introduce yourself? Mom looked at me with a dramatically dropped jaw. Quite the guts for someone breaking the law, Mom said, turning back to the woman. Why don't you focus on packing your witchcraft and get out of our house? My cheeks burned. I wanted to shrink to the size of a mouse. I hated the way she talked to people. Especially people who, in her words, were happy for no reason. Hippies, waiters, people handing out flyers, neighbors, cashiers. The nicer they were, the meaner she got. Please stop, I whispered. Mom reached down and squeezed my wrist. There's no problem here, Emma. Just a solution, Mom said. They have a problem. We have a solution. We're on our way out, ma'am, the dad said. The couple went back to packing. Mom huffed in victory, but the boy didn't move. He kept looking at us. I stared back, but he didn't break. He was dressed like it was his first communion. His hair was perfectly swooshed and his shirt was free of wrinkles. An impressive feat for a little kid. He reminded me of a doll. I don't know why I didn't look away. We were in a full-blown staring contest. I think I was trying to figure him out, the same way you stare at an abstract painting. He reached out and grabbed my hand. It was ice cold. If you see Lisa, tell her we moved to the city, he said. I don't want her to think we left without her. Mom, who was back at the car looking at a map, tossed it on the seat and walked over. She shooed the boy's hand away from mine. Go to your keepers, little devil, Mom said. I looked up at her and she winked at me. I could tell she was trying not to laugh. My mom's emotional range always amazed me. She could go from yelling at strangers to making fun of children in the blink of an eye. After the hippies left, Mom and I unpacked. We got a few boxes in before our new landlord walked over. Marjorie lived across the street in a slightly larger, slightly newer-looking house. It was twice as tall as ours, with rooms built on top of rooms, each floor wider as it stretched into the sky. It looked like a giant dreidel. She had two German shepherds with her. Their fur was so dark it was almost black. They were taller than her hip and had big, yellow eyes. As she walked on our lawn, they started barking. Spit hung off their jaws. I'm Marjorie! She yelled over the barking. She was standing on the other side of the lawn, but the dogs were out ahead of her. She didn't bother pulling them back. They came within a foot of my face. I ducked behind Mom. Yes, Miss Marjorie, hello, Mom said. Mom stuck out her hand, which made the dog snap. Mom didn't seem to notice. Somehow, she managed to scratch behind their ears. Miss Dog Whisperer, Marjorie said. Marjorie was an older woman with a short bob and big square glasses. She walked with a slight hunch, as if the wind was too heavy for her. But despite looking weak, she couldn't stand still. Every few seconds, she shifted from chewing her lip to kicking the grass to snorting air. Between her and the snapping dogs, there was never a moment of peace. They were like a fever that wouldn't break. Rent's due first of the month, she said. Don't be like those tree huggers. All they wanted to do was accuse me of horrible crimes and pray to their shrubbery gods. Marjorie spit onto our lawn. Mom laughed, as if she admired her bravery. Who would do something as vile as spit on someone else's lawn? You're a tough lady, Mom said. I like that. This time, I rolled my eyes. I don't know if Marjorie saw it, but I didn't care. I didn't like Marjorie for the same reasons I didn't like my mom. 
They were dressed like twins at a funeral, both of their outfits the same shade of shapeless gray. I miss the hippies. I miss their hair, their bright colors, their inflections. I wanted to be like that, but I knew I was no better than Mom and Marjorie. My sweater was white, and my pants were an off-white shade of the same white. I was at least wearing my fun shoes, green slippers with pink soles. Mom always said clothes were supposed to cover you up, not show you off. Somehow, she let the green slippers slide. Clothes were just one of the million ways Mom liked to keep me in line. We never ate dinner after 6 p.m. I was only allowed to read C.S. Lewis books. Mom liked how the lion was a metaphor for Jesus. And I could only watch the church TV channel or Mom approved VHSs. On the night of my stupid mistake... We had just finished a dinner of angel hair pasta and butter. We watched Angels in the Outfield and went to bed at 9 p.m. When I got in bed, I had the strangest feeling, like I was at the top of a water slide. I pulled the bottle of pills out from under my pillow. When I found them the week before in the CVS parking lot, I thought they would give me interesting dreams. But as I stared at them, I thought about all the dreams I could have if I was dead. No more mom, no more buttered noodles, no more VHSs. If I took enough pills, maybe I'd be reincarnated in a different life, where I wore pink shirts and yellow pants and sing at the top of my lungs just because I wanted to. Marjorie's dogs threw me out of my trance. They were barking a few inches from my face now. I grabbed a box off the lawn and walked inside. Our new home was mostly dust was on the walls and the floorboards, covering the sinks. As the light came in through the windows, I saw it all around me. I was used to it, though. Mom always picked dusty houses. Our new house in Twin Pines was our 13th rental. Mom would flip-flop between different types of houses. Apartments, two families, trailers, etc. But dusty Victorian seemed to be her favorite. She liked fragile houses. One where, if you use something twice, it would break. In one of the houses, the sink looked like something out of a fairy tale, with gold gooseneck faucets and hand-drawn hot-cold script. But after two uses, the water shot toward the ceiling. I dropped the box in the kitchen and went up to explore my new room. The house came pre-furnished, but all I was given was a bed and a mirror. The bed still had the creepy boy's Toy Story comforter. The mirror was tall and oval-shaped, with metal, human-looking feet. I sat on the corner of the bed and stared at my reflection. I didn't like looking at myself. Reflections were like words you repeat so much they lose their meaning. After a few minutes, my whole body looked like a sack of potatoes. The only thing non-potato-like was my hair. I always liked my hair, even if I fantasized about shaving it off. One time... We were in a bookstore, and I saw a Sinead O'Connor CD. I thought her shaved head was badass. She looked like an angry baby, but in a, in a cool way. I looked again in the mirror. I reached up and grabbed a clump of blonde. One day, I said. I let go of it and stood up. I needed to get back to moving boxes. But as I got to my feet, I heard something. Footsteps. They were inside my room. I turned to look, but no one was there. The birds flew into my throat. All of a sudden, I felt terribly alone. Mom and Marjorie's conversation fell quiet. The wind pushed against the window. The sun ducked behind a hill. All that was left was me and the sound. It moved closer and closer. It was behind me. I closed my eyes and scrunched my face. I took a long, slow breath, then whipped around, my hands out like a shield. I slapped the air. I opened my eyes. No one, or no thing, was there. But the sound grew louder and closer. Hello? I said. My mouth was a sandbox. I put my hand on my chest. My heart was going crazy. Calm down, Emma. Breathe. Remember, what did the doctor tell you? If 
you panic, you just need to breathe. Each breath felt like licking sandpaper. The footsteps came closer. Dust kicked up into clouds. It was just a few feet away now. Then closer. Then inches. I wanted to throw up, or, or scream, or cry. All of a sudden, the house felt huge. There were shadows holding shadows holding shadows. I was in dark water. How many rooms were here? Two, three, ten, one hundred? How many floors? Mom never said. It was the biggest house we'd ever lived in. I, I wasn't safe. I didn't know what I wasn't safe from, but I knew I was in danger. I looked down. The sound stopped right in front of my green slippers. It lingered there. I felt it breathe on my ankles. It was warm and wet. Please, I whispered. Don't hurt me. There was a long pause. The sound didn't move. An icky feeling ran up my arms. It was like a thousand fingertips. I took a step back. I moved my right foot. The sound didn't attack. I lifted my left. Then, the pain flew up my leg. I screamed and jumped back, landing hard on my butt. I crawled backwards, desperate to move as far away as I could from that thing. I kicked, I swung, I spit. All of my nerves fired at once. Get away from me! I looked down at my ankle. Dark blood fell in lightning bolts down my toes. My skin pulsed. There were three cuts. They weren't deep, but it didn't matter. I'd never been hurt by the air before. I felt naked. It could be behind me, above me, below me, crawling through my suitcase, tangled in my hair, hiding under the bed. I, I was surrounded. But at the same time, totally alone. I slid into the corner and curled into a ball. My eyes welled. I couldn't stop it. I felt it all at once. The new town, the new house, the new neighbors. The thing, or whatever it was. The pain in my foot. I slapped myself in the head. Why did I have to do such a stupid, stupid thing? I could be back in my old school, ignoring my teachers and eating lunch alone like a normal kid. After a few minutes, my ankle stopped bleeding. I stood up and checked myself for more wounds. I was unscathed. But my hands wouldn't stop shaking. I held my breath and listened for more footsteps. They were gone. The thing was gone. All I heard was Mom and Marjorie's small talk. The dogs were still barking. I wiped away my tears with the Toy Story comforter. I let the blood dry on my foot. Maybe Mom would see and ask me about it. As I reached the top of the staircase, I hooked the sides of my mouth and pulled my face into a smile. Then, I walked downstairs to finish unpacking. After a few hours of unpacking, Mom heated up two TV dinners and we watched Flubber. When the movie ended, Mom announced it was bedtime. The sun was still up, but I didn't mind. Sleep would do me good. Maybe that thing was just an exhaustion-induced hallucination. As Mom washed off our plastic trays, I watched her from the doorway of our new kitchen. I contemplated telling her about my ankle. It's not like it was some sort of secret. If she looked at me, she'd see it. My foot was caked in blood. But she didn't look at me. She only looked at me when she had to. Instead, she hummed a gospel song and scrubbed like the marinara was devil's blood. So, I grabbed a glass of water, walked upstairs, and collapsed onto the bed. I dug my face into the Toy Story comforter. It smelled like a home. Not quite my home, but someone's home. And that was enough to relax me. My shoulders melted. My eyelids grew heavy. My breathing slowed. Outside, I heard the distant hum of thunder. A summer storm was on its way. Darkness came in waves as the thunder moved closer. I knew sleep was coming. I felt so relaxed. Eerily relaxed. I hadn't been this relaxed since I was a little kid. Before the incident or the incidents pre-incident, or the incident before that. There were too many to count. I just settled on the fact that I was cursed. But at this moment, I was at peace. Unfortunately, it didn't last long. Someone knocked on the door. 
Emma? It was a familiar voice. Come in, I said. The door opened and Mom appeared. Her hair was brushed and she was wearing her flowing white nightgown. Normally, that meant she wasn't leaving her room for the night. She never came out to see me like this. I sat on the edge of my bed. I was doing some reflecting, she said, and I just want you to know that all strength comes from God. Give him your time and you will receive his strength. I nodded, like I always did. I'd heard this one before, but as she rambled, something felt different. She smiled, rubbed my arm, and spoke in a soft whisper. It was like someone took my mom and smoothed the edges. I remembered a version of her like this. Before dad left, she would bake pies and sing Motown songs and wear sundresses. But I hadn't seen that mom in a long time. Then I noticed something. It was my mirror. The one with the weird human feet. It held mom's reflection, or at least a version of her reflection. The, the back of her nightgown had tears in it. Mom never wore anything that wasn't perfect. Maybe the move to Twin Pines was God's plan. She went on. Do you feel that way? Mom cleared the hair from my face. Gosh, I love your hair. She said. So blonde and beautiful. Like an angel. I tried to look her in the eyes, but I couldn't. The mirror kept drawing me in. The mom in the reflection was also leaning over me in bed, but slowly she turned her face back toward the mirror. I looked at the real mom. Her head wasn't moving. Mirror mom kept going, though. Her chin crossed her shoulder. She twisted like an owl. I could see a sliver of face, then half, then all of it. Her head was turned completely around. I looked at her eyes. A shiver crawled down my neck. I looked away. I was getting that feeling again, that flutter of panic, that scattering of birds. I tried to breathe. I tried to collect myself. I turned to look out the window. Outside, dark clouds moved over the hills. Rain fell slow at first, then faster and faster until it was pounding on the windows. Wind shoved the walls. I heard the house's frame shift. I'd been in old houses before, but none this old. One more gust and the whole thing could fall over. The more I thought about it, the stranger it seemed that mom was here. Whenever there was a storm, mom locked herself in her room and blasted her Jesus tapes. She said rain made her think of all the evils in the world. I looked back at the real mom. Do you hear me, little angel? Mom asked. Yes. So answer. Answer? Answer my question. What was your... Do you feel like moving to Twin Pines was God's plan? Oh, I said. Her face moved closer to mine. When did her teeth get so white? Yes, I do. So you never want to leave here? She kept running her hands through my hair. Her fingertips were freezing. I looked at the mirror, Mom. She wasn't smiling. She had a hard stare, her eyes as bright as the moon. She didn't blink. I kept watching. Blink. Please blink, Mom. Please. But she never did. Her face was a statue. Is this a dream? I asked the real Mom. She didn't answer. My sweet angel tried to go back to heaven. She whispered. I pinched my thighs. I felt the pain. It was real. I was awake. I tried to sit up, but Mom pushed me back down. Where are you going? She asked. Her smile kept growing, closer and closer to her ears. I looked over at Mirror Mom. The smile was inverted, her frown dripping toward the floor like melting wax. I need to pee, I said. Are you lying to me? No, I... You wouldn't lie to your mother, would you? Not again. No, Mom. I just, I... Mom didn't like talking about why I did what I did. But she loved making me promise I'd never do it again. 
Not again. She'd make me repeat it. Not again. Not again. Not again. I wouldn't lie to her. I wouldn't hurt myself. I wouldn't let the devil in. The mirror woman started to change. She raised her arms, then flipped them behind her. She looked like one of the Barbies I used to torture. She stood up and walked over to the mirror. She lifted her backwards hands and brought them to her backwards face. She grabbed two fistfuls of hair. I I wanted to warn the real mom, but I couldn't speak. It was the same feeling I always felt. Powerless. Scared. Frozen in a dumb state of terror, all I could do was watch. The mirror woman stood in front of her reflection and pulled on her hair. At first, she'd only rip out a strand or two. Then it came in handfuls. The sound made me sick. It was like Velcro. Her frown kept sinking. Her face was saggy and bruised, with lips covered in scars. Drops of blood ran from her forehead down her chin. She started mouthing something. Not again. Not again. Not again. She was screaming now, but there was no sound. She was silent. Not again, right? Real mom said. She kept brushing my hair with her hand. It was starting to hurt. With each pull, small strands broke loose and tingled in her fingers. Stop. Please. I whispered. It'll never stop. Will it, Angel? (laughs) She chuckled. Thunder rolled through the bed frame. The storm was here. We couldn't run away. The storm was here. Tears streamed down my cheeks. I didn't mean to do it, I said. Do what, honey? It, I said. You know, it. It was a stupid mistake. I looked back at the mirror. Mirror mom was almost bald. All that remained were a few tufts of hair, the last stalks of a torched cornfield. Her frown stretched down to her clavicle. Are you cold? Mom asked. What? She pulled the blankets up to my chin. She pressed down on my neck. I coughed, but she pressed harder. Ma! You look so cold, Angel! I gasped for air, pushing at the blanket. Mom pressed harder, using her body weight. She never stopped smiling. Angel shouldn't be so cold. So blue. So frozen. Angels should be white and warm and flying. Why is my angel so blue? The thunder roared every few seconds. Mirror mom dropped to her knees. She ran her hands across her bald head. She mouthed those same horrible words. The words mom worked into her prayers loud enough so I would hear. The words she made me promise whenever I had a bad day or cried or didn't laugh during the funny part in the movie. My breaths came few and far between. The room went black. I saw stars. I kicked and pushed and squirmed. But I only sank deeper and deeper and deeper and... A flash of lightning filled the room. It sounded like our house was hit. It was the loudest crash I'd ever heard, like a car coming through my window. The pressure left my neck. I gulped fresh air and pounced forward. (sighs) Stop! I yelled. I looked up at Mom, but she was gone. The room was quiet. All that was left was the sound of rain. I looked at the mirror, but it was empty too. I was alone. It was a nightmare. I wiped the sweat off my forehead and reached down to grab my glass of water. It had a thin layer of dust on it, but I didn't care. I was medically thirsty. As I drank, I placed my hand on my heart was galloping. How much could a heart really take? It was going to explode if I kept up with these nightmares and ghosts. I looked at myself in the mirror. I was still intact. My head was not popped off. My hair was not torn to shreds. My mouth was not contorted into a horrific smile or frown. I was okay. I finished the water and put the empty glass on the ground. I went to lay back down, but I noticed something. My reflection was disappearing. A cloud of darkness came over it. It climbed around the edges of the mirror like black ink, swallowing me in its pulses. It kept eating me until the mirror was an oil spill, nothing but black. Then, like the first stars of night, 
two yellow dots appeared. They were towards the bottom of the mirror, right at the height of my ankles when they got slashed. The darkness fled from the top down to the yellow circles. Black dots appeared in their centers. They were eyes. Two yellow eyes. Black ink circled around them in a vague shape of a head. The face disappeared below the mirror's rim. Then I heard it. It was moving toward me. The footsteps would start, then stop, then start again. They went near the walls, under the bed, by the water glass, near the door. But they never left the room. Meanwhile, the storm moved over our house. Rain pounded the roof. It wanted to be let in. Drops of water raced down the wall. The house was falling apart. Everything was falling apart. I tried to focus on my breathing. I didn't want to think about the thing. I looked out the window. It was a trick I learned in the hospital. Everything is always so loud. I'd hear my friends getting taken to the quiet rooms or parents yelling at the caretakers. I never wanted to be where I was. So I looked out the window. The hospital was in New Brunswick, right across from Rutgers University. I watched frat boys play frisbee, girls with tattoos smoked cigarettes. I wanted to be there, to be older, to be in life instead of just watching other people live it. But in our new town, there were no college kids to fantasize about. All I had were hills. So I imagined I was in the Swiss Alps with the friends I made at the hospital. There were three girls I really connected with. We ate lunch together. They showed me their scars and visible rib cages. We made fun of the therapists. We'd all been struggling, but now we were struggling together. Out in the Alps, we weren't gloomy anymore. We were all drinking wine and smoking long cigarettes. The breeze was soft. Animals climbed the hills. My head was shaved. We were all happy, just like goats along the cliffs. I closed my eyes and pulled the blanket over my face. Marjorie's dogs were barking. The rain became like white noise. For a moment, I felt myself fall asleep. But then, I opened my eyes. The sound was high-pitched, hissing. It started out soft, then it built higher and higher, rising from a match to a wildfire. I covered my ears. The sound cut through everything. I felt it in my stomach. It rattled the birdcage. I kicked off the blankets and ran for the light switch. I flicked it on, but nothing happened. Everything was still dark. I looked around. I was still alone. Was mom hearing this kettle? It was like a train crashing into my temple. I felt like puking. I opened my suitcase and searched for a flashlight. Did I pack my flashlight? Did I even own a flashlight? Where do people buy flashlights? The sound kept building. It was already stupidly loud. How was it getting louder? Yet simultaneously, it grew deeper, churning from a hiss to a growl. It shook the house. I couldn't tell where it was coming from. The storm or the thing. Rain ran down the walls in streams. The floor was covered in puddles. I kept digging through my suitcase. I didn't find the flashlight, but I did find my dad's electric razor. It was the only thing he left behind. I always brought it with me in case he ever wanted it back. I clicked it on and held it in front of me. It was my only protection. I looked under my bed. Nothing. I looked in the closet. Nothing. Behind the mirror, nothing. The sound kept building. I stood in the center of the room and spun around. This was it. This is the moment I get ripped apart. The moment I die. I couldn't back out of it this time. I thought about mom finding me. My jaw hanging off, my eyes chewed out, my guts scattered like confetti. Would she scream, cry, walk back to her room? Would she ever recover? What would happen when the paramedics found me? Would they jigsaw my limbs into a human shape? Would they go home and cry in their spouse's arms? Would I be the worst day of their life? It was always me. Everything came back to me. I am the root cause of every problem in the world. What did I do? I yelled. I couldn't hear my own voice. The room was too loud. 
I kept spinning around, my puny razor in front of me. I'm sorry. I went on. Whatever I did, I'm, I'm sorry about it. Lightning struck our shed, the backyard filled with smoke. I was getting dizzy from twisting around. I just wanted the noise to stop. I couldn't take it anymore. I turned and turned until, all of a sudden, light passed through my skull. My eyelids snapped shut. The floor hit my back. Everything went dark. At first, it felt like my face was glued shut. The darkness was a weighted blanket, but after a few attempts, I was able to open my eyes. I looked up at the ceiling. There was a black web in the corner. The wood splintered and filled with pulsing embers. Smoke crowded the windows. We'd been hit. Lightning hit our house. I had to tell Mom. I tried to stand up, but my whole body was in pain. My legs were wet cement. I laid back down. I stared at the lightning strike as the rain attacked the roof. Debris fell into the room. Black ash covered the bed. If I was sleeping, the coals would have smothered me. I imagined that death, my skin peeling back, burnt wood filling my mouth. The clouds of smoke started to shrink. They were regathering, vacuuming back to the impact point. It didn't take long for the shape to appear. First, I saw its head. The top of its skull was flat, with two horns on either side. The smoke reformed to fill the rest of its body. Two arms, two legs, a massive arched back. There were three claws on the end of its hands, just like the three slashes on my ankle. Only this time, they were ten times the size. If that thing attacked me now, I'd be ground beef. What do you want? I mouthed. With each swell of the storm, the thing grew taller. Its eyes hovered over me. The smoke widened. It enveloped me. I couldn't see. My spit turned to black sludge. My bedroom smelled like a campfire. Then, slowly, the creature slunk through the shattered window and moved through the storm, right towards Marjorie's house. In the distance, her dogs whimpered. Their violent barking was gone. Now, they sounded sad, almost nervous, like they were about to be punished. Once the shock from the lightning strike wore off, I was able to stand. I kept walking in small circles, chewing on my fingernails. The creature hung over Marjorie's house like a thousand swarming bats. The dogs stopped barking. There was a long, grueling silence. The rain grew soft as the thunder fell to a dull whisper. The storm was now a breeze, yet I couldn't help but feel like I was at the start of something much worse. The cloud made a sound like a foghorn, then shifted. It broke into Marjorie's windows and swarmed through her house, purring something deep and horrendous. It was not a please pet me purr. This was loud, end of the world loud. I felt the vibration run up my legs. The monster twisted and turned as it went from room to room, rushing through doorways. Every once in a while, its eyes appeared. It was searching for something. All of a sudden, Marjorie's living room window shattered. Glass rained onto the lawn as the black cloud gathered on the first floor. Then, something yelped. An object flew through the shattered window. It rolled through the grass like a crash test dummy, thrashing and lifeless. It landed on the road. The fog thinned out. An upstairs light turned on. I heard Marjorie's voice. Beelzy? Bub? Boys? Where are you? I grabbed Dad's razor and ran downstairs. I was still in my pajamas. I didn't have time to change. To confront this monster in some badass getup. No cape or steel-toed boots. Not even a rain jacket. Just me. Emma. In all my poorly prepared glory. I ran through the house and pounced through the front door, my razor out in front of me like a sword. As I leapt through the muddy yard toward the road, I got a clearer picture of what flew out of Marjorie's house. When I got closer, I knew for sure. I stopped running. The razor buzzed in my hand as my brief feeling of power went away. It clicked off. I was too late. I knelt beside the German shepherd and put my finger on its neck. No pulse. 
I couldn't look at the animal for long. The sight of it made me sick. It was as if all of its features shifted a few inches in different directions. I never loved Marjorie's dogs, but no crime justified this kind of punishment. I stood up and looked at Marjorie's house. The thing was gone. Marjorie walked from room to room, calling out for Beelzy. I let out a long sigh. Again, I was useless. Again, I lost. The monster won. Marjorie's dog was dead. Throughout the battle, I just stood and watched, just like so many things in my life. I waited around for a better version of me to show up. I turned to go back into our house, my head down. As I moped through the grass, I noticed something strange. There was a stream of mud running from our house to the road. In it were little specks of white. I reached down and grabbed one. It was pencil thin, but dull at the ends. It didn't take me long to realize. It was a bone. I followed the bones to their origin, a dank space under our front steps. I knelt down in the mud and inspected. The bones multiplied as I crawled behind the cinder blocks. I couldn't get my whole body through, just to my hips, but I got far enough. The skeleton was small, about purse-sized. It had a collar around its neck. I read the tag. L-Y-S-S-A. My eyes grew wide. I imagined the little boy. I pictured him in the months leading up to this morning, running around the house, calling out with all his might. I felt his cold hand in my own. If you see Lisa, tell her we moved to the city. I don't know what I thought Lisa was when he said that, but I didn't think she was a dead cat. But somehow I, I found her anyway. I found Lisa. I was halfway inside the dead cat's grave when I heard my mom's voice. Emma! I squeezed my torso out from under the stairs. Mom was standing over me. There was mud on the bottom of her nightgown and her hair was soaked. She crossed her arms over her chest, her yelling stance. Why are you out here? I stood up and slapped the mud off my pajamas. It only made it smear. Mom took a step closer. I said, why are you out here? My mind was racing. I couldn't focus on Mom or my soon-to-be punishment. I kept thinking about Marjorie's dog. Its look of confusion, dismay, regret. I pictured its broken teeth. There was so much anger in its injuries, such revenge. I imagined the thing, my ankle, the way it moved around my room. The way it purred, its shape in the upper corner of my room. I remembered how those dogs snapped at me. How prone to violence they were. The pieces came together. Marjorie's dogs killed Lisa. That is not an answer to my question. And, and who? What? It was Marjorie's dogs. They killed the dead cat. Well, it, it wasn't dead then. They, they made it dead. Who's dead cat? What? Are you on drugs? Lisa, I said. Remember, the little boy? I grabbed Mom by the wrist so she'd know how serious I was. He had a cat, Lisa. I, I found it. I, I think Marjorie's dogs killed it. First of all, you shouldn't get involved in other people's problems, Mom said. That's too messy for a little girl. I shuddered when she said it. Little girl. My thoughts ran off. I was back in the hospital in those first few days after my accident. I kept going in and out of consciousness. It was all blurred. It's not like I had visitors to mark the days by. All I saw were nurses, strangers. It wasn't that no one wanted to see me. No one visited me because mom didn't tell anyone I was in the hospital. Mom didn't visit me either. She said she would pick me up when I was done. To this day, she's never told anyone what happened with me. Not even Dad. So the only people I saw were the hospital staff. It was one woman I saw a lot. She was old with a round face and soft, plump fingers. She spoke in an annoyingly cheerful Midwest drawl. She would adjust my pillow and give me medicine and hum lullabies. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Mary had a little lamb. Ring around the rosy. At first, I thought it was creepy. 
Then I remembered I was in the children's ward. One day, she leaned in real close to my face. I don't know if she thought I was sleeping, but I was wide awake. I kept my eyes closed. I didn't want to scare her. She smelled like peppermint and sweat. For a moment, I was scared. I thought she was going to hurt me, but she didn't. Instead, she whispered directly into my face. This is too much pain for a little girl. Little girl. Now, standing in the rain, I heard that old woman's voice again. Little girl. Little girl. Little girl. That's how mom saw me. That's how the world saw me. But it wasn't true. The things I felt were far from little. They were big and dark and thundering. I looked back at Lisa. Her body was broken by the rain. She was little, even for a cat. But still, I felt her power, her rage, her revenge. In that state, she was bigger than me. The dog, our house, her pain. She could consume galaxies. She had my attention in the deepest, darkest way. She wasn't little, and neither was I. I turned back to Mom. I pulled the razor out of my pocket and clicked it on. Honey? She said. She stepped toward me. I stepped back. She started to say something else, but I couldn't hear her. The buzzing was too loud. I brought the razor to my forehead and went across my scalp. It was a rough, ticklish feeling. Wet hair fell to the mud, right around Lisa's bones. Mom lunged at me, but I jumped away. I kept shaving. When Mom realized she couldn't stop me, she clasped her hands in prayer and looked at the stars. God, please shine your light on Emma. Please, just... She paused for a moment. Then she shook her head and unclasped her hands. She looked confused and sad. I could tell she wanted to say something. She looked at me, her eyelids flickering, but she didn't say it. Instead, she bit her fist and walked back into the house. As I finished, lightning struck in the distance. The storm was now towns away. All that remained was a drizzle. It was cold, and it hit my newly bald head. Even after I finished, I stayed outside. The birds in my stomach whistled something cheerful. My hair was tangled in the razor. The morning sun was peeking over the hills. Marjorie was in her backyard, calling Beelzy's name into the wind. I was happy and sad and confused. But more than anything, I was feeling. And that felt good. Really, really good. I looked out at Twin Pines, my new hometown. Everyone was still asleep. On normal mornings, most people stayed asleep. People didn't wake up in a sleepy town. They were forever yawning, forever on the verge of sleep, forever wrestling with the dark. But tomorrow morning, that would change. In the morning, the town would look into the eyes of a dead dog and wonder what happened when we were all asleep. I kept rubbing my newly shaved head. I smiled and it hurt my face. I don't think I'd smiled in three years. It was a new feeling, a new me. Even if this town was forever sleepy, I was finally awake. I woke up covered in sweat. My ears rang, my head hurt. The previous night came back to me in waves. Dead animals, evil clouds, bolts of lightning. I ran my head across my scalp. I was still bald. At least that part was real. I got out of bed and looked out the window. Marjorie's dog was gone, but a trail of blood ran from the middle of the road to her front door. I guess the dead dog was also real. I ran downstairs. Mom was sitting at the kitchen table reading the newspaper. I sat across from her and pushed it aside. Do you remember what happened last night? I asked. She pulled the edges of the newspaper back to life and kept reading. She didn't look up at me, but every few seconds she ran her hand across her head. Is this silent treatment about my hair? 
I asked. She didn't answer. I grabbed her glass of water and studied myself in the bloated reflection. I still had chunks of hair that I missed with the clipper, and my hairline looked like a heart monitor. I didn't look good, but I look like me. I hadn't looked like me in a long time. I looked back at mom. She flipped the page of the newspaper. I'm not talking to you until you end your little phase, she said. But you just talked, I said. Since you're my daughter and I'm legally responsible for you, mom said. I will let you know that I'll be out all day looking for a job. Please unpack and, if you feel so inclined, dispose of the dead cat under our stairs. The dead cat under our stairs. Right. Lisa. Sure, yeah, I said. I'll take care of her. It, Mom said. And yes, you will. I will. Good. Good. I smiled and scrunched up my nose. Mom didn't look up from the newspaper. We weren't great at bantering. Mom puffed her hair with hairspray and wore her only blazer. After she left, I went outside and buried Lisa's bones. I didn't dispose of them like Mom wanted. Instead, I dug a hole in the backyard using a snow shovel. Then, one bone at a time, I laid her to rest. I didn't sing or pray or tell a story. Lisa and I's relationship was short-lived and traumatic, much like the rest of my relationships. After the funeral, I got ready to hit the town. I put on my best explorer outfit, hiking boots, white shorts, a Steve Irwin button-down. I threw granola bars into my Jan sport, borrowed mom's gardening hat, and was out the door. As someone who's moved to a lot of towns, I know the basics of a new town exploration. First, you stroll down the main street, you need to investigate the stores. You don't go inside of them. No, you need to analyze them first. There are towns that want visitors and towns that want people to stay away. The stores let you know what kind of town it is. Law offices and dentists? That's a get in and get out kind of town. No lingering. No reading poetry by fountains. No small talk by the cafe. Then there are welcome to our town towns. Towns with bookstores and movie theaters and boutiques. Towns with people walking around. Towns where people conversate. Where you're allowed to exist. Twin Pines was neither of those. Twin Pines was unlike any town I'd ever seen. Twin Pines was a forgotten town. Half the stores were closed, and the other half were antique shops. I peeked in their windows... There were statues of dead presidents and teapots and cheesy signs, but no customers. Each store was manned by a different old lady. Outside, the sidewalks were empty. There were no cars on the street. I saw one person all morning. He was old as time and walked with a crazy looking cane. It was wooden with giant eagles carved into it. It took him three light changes to cross the street. The only thing Twin Pines had going for it was the nature. The hills were gigantic, with bird clouds circling the peaks. The air smelled like pine. The breeze was always a little too cold. It was beautiful, but nature towns always had weirdos. People who live in the woods are normally hiding something. That something isn't always, I murdered a bunch of people. Sometimes it's, I filed for bankruptcy in Kansas City. But sometimes it is the murder one. I kept walking Main Street until the sidewalk crumbled into the grass. When I hit the end, I looked ahead. There was one last store. It was on a hill across the silent highway. It's neon light like a north star. The sign flickered in the gray sky. Tape head video. I walked up the hill to the video store. The windows were covered in tattered movie posters, and the sidewalk was littered with candy bar wrappers. Outside, there was a kid my age, leaning against the wall, smoking a cigarette. He was tall and skinny, with long, shaggy hair. He was wearing a Bad Brains t-shirt. I didn't know what Bad Brains was, but I wanted to find out. Nice shirt, I said. He didn't look at me. He took another drag and turned his attention to our view of Twin Pines. 
He looked down on it like some sort of bastard prince. He seemed cool, but not in a nice way. From all the different schools I'd gone to, I knew how to spot the cool kids. It wasn't a compliment. Okay, no response, I said. I take back my compliment. What's so nice about my shirt? He asked. This time, he looked at me. He had dark eyes and thin, talon-like eyebrows. His stare was piercing. All I meant was that it's a nice shirt, I said. I've never seen anything like it. You don't have to be ru- If you saw a UFO, would you also call that nice? Is everything that's new also nice to you? Or was there a different word you could have used? I scratched my newly shaved head, as if to harness its power. I don't think Lisa would put up with this. But, then again, Lisa was also a murderer. I didn't want to murder this guy for being rude, but I wasn't going to back down either. That's what the old me would have done. I just meant your shirt was nice, I said. Is that really a big deal? Every interaction is an opportunity, he said. We are gifted with the most powerful weapon in the course of earthly life. If we use words like they are chicken feed, then we're going to cultivate the brains of chickens. But if we use words for what they are, an opportunity to expand each other's minds, share experience, and challenge thought, then we evolve. Telling a stranger they have a nice shirt is a waste of that power. It's as if Superman used his powers to become a power lifter. He flicked the butt of his cigarette into the grass. I know you had other thoughts. You were thinking a lot about my shirt. Don't flatter yourself, I said. I imagine Lisa, her little body turning into that massive cloud, her anger manifested in that bright and brilliant way. Her rage transcended into... Who is Lisa? The boy asked. I turned to look at him. He was smirking. He felt naked. How did he do that? Did I accidentally say it out loud? I didn't like him in my brain. That was my safe place, my only safe place. I didn't want his nasty cigarette fingers sorting through my thoughts. I took a step away. I tried not to think. But I was. Could he hear this right now? Yes. He said. How did you... I look back at Twin Pines. If I ran, I could get home in about ten minutes. Hopefully, he couldn't read my mind from that far. Then I could go back to my normal tasks and peace. Unpacking, cleaning my room, decorating my stupid house to look less stupid. But if I was honest with myself, I was curious. How did this jerk read my thoughts? Jerk is a little strong, he said. And my mom calls it extreme empathy. It comes in waves. I don't really get how it works, if that makes you feel any better. Sometimes it just happens. It's like when mail gets delivered to the wrong house. I nodded, but I didn't really understand. That's kind of... strange, I said. We stood in silence for a minute as he lit a second cigarette. Above us, the tape head video sign buzzed like a wasp's nest. We looked out over our shared boring town. You could look at the whole thing without ever turning your head. I looked at my watch. It was 10 a.m. The air was warming up. Bugs started to swarm my face. I swatted them away. I hated bugs. I wish I could lie and say I had plans, but I didn't. Standing next to this mind-reading douche and breathing his cigarette smoke was the only thing on my roster all day. I guess this was life in Twin Pines. Want to go inside? He asked. I looked at him. He smiled. He had a big gap between his two front teeth, and what mom would call a sad smile. What's inside? I asked. This guy has some cool stuff, old movies and shit. Apparently, he bought the place a few weeks ago. I've only met him once. He's a bit weird, but I won't hold that against him. Weird? You can't use a different word? He laughed. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. He said. He reached his hand out to me. I'm Preston. I shook his hand. He had a weak, nervous grip. Emma, I said. And like that, I made my first friend. I still kind of hated him, but he already knew that. The inside of Tapehead Video was simultaneously cluttered and abandoned looking. There were stacks of boxes and loose piles of candy bars. 
but everything was already covered in dust. The air, cold and sour tasting. The aisles were broken out by genre, horror, comedy, action, drama, etc. Each aisle had a wooden sign above it with a different cartoon. Horror had a little Frankenstein, action, a pistol, drama, a crying face, etc. I'd never been inside a video store before. Mom always made me wait in the car while she ran in and grabbed the first vaguely Jesus movie she saw. Today, though, I was free from her watchful eye. I could enter any world I wanted. What do you like to watch? Preston asked. I'm into anything, really, I lied. Well, horror is the height of all cinematic experience, Preston said. If art is meant to convey emotion, then horror wins. When you're scared, you're feeling so many emotions at once. Fear, love, shock, concern, motivation, grief, regret, laughter, you name it. You go through the whole spectrum during a horror movie. The genre doesn't get the respect it deserves. Sure, yeah, definitely, I said. So, horror it is? Why not, I said. We walked toward the Frankenstein sign when the owner appeared. He jumped up from behind the counter and blocked our path. He was tall and lanky, with a head full of gray, springy curls. He looked between Preston and I, back and forth in quick succession. I don't know how he didn't get dizzy. Welcome, beautiful souls. How lovely of you both to grace my establishment this morning. His voice was soft and bouncy. He reached out to grab Preston's shoulder, which Preston backed away from. The man was unfazed. If anything, the rejection made him warmer. Smile wider, stare more intently. I looked over at Preston. I don't know if he was reading the guy's mind, but if he was, he wasn't liking what he saw. Why are you so cheery? Preston asked. Excuse me? The man asked. Not to be rude, but you're coming at us with a lot of, uh, heat? The man wrapped himself in a hug and rocked side to side. He looked up at the bright ceiling, his smile growing by the second. He sang a melody I hadn't heard before. It's a wonderful day to be alive. The trees are green, the sky's blue, and we're alive. I wanted to laugh, but held it in. Preston, on the other hand, didn't have my restraint. Is this a prank show? He asked. The man shook his head. No, no, no. Everything is exactly where it should be. Isn't that wonderful? Sure, yeah, it's great. But we didn't come to tape head video for therapy. Preston picked up a tape and inspected it. He looked disappointed. We're looking for something really scary. I don't mean like jump scare scary or bad CGI scary. I mean scary, really scary. The man's eyes grew wide. He smiled, then swiped it off his face. He tried to look serious, but he couldn't. The longer he lingered on the question, the more he smiled. And the more he smiled, the more worried Preston looked. Do you know what you're asking for? The man asked. Preston and I nodded. I was just following Preston's lead. I, I didn't know what it was I was asking for. Follow me then, children. Preston and I followed the man through the winding halls of the video store to a door in the back. The sign above it read, The Happy Corner. The words looked handwritten by a child. There was a smiley face etched into it. The man pulled out a bundle of keys. Here we are, my curious birds. After he found the key, he slipped it in the lock and turned. As the door opened, Preston and I walked in. The room was basically a closet. The walls were covered with unmarked VHS tapes. No names, no pictures, no production logos. Just sleek, black spines. The only other objects in the room were a foldable chair and a TV on a cardboard box. Is this some sort of torture dungeon? The man laughed. No, no, no. Quite the opposite. He said. This room will free you from any tortures. Preston laughed, and the man laughed some more. I felt like they were laughing about different things. Meanwhile, I ran my fingers along the dustless spines. I tipped one back. The cover was also blank. I pulled it out and popped it open. There was a VHS inside. It was blank too. I looked over at Preston. He was already sitting in the chair. The man stood above him, sorting through the blank VHSs until he found the perfect one. 
I tried to catch Preston's eye. He was staring at the TV, rubbing his knees in excitement. I didn't know him, or this man, or this store, but I did know one thing. Twin Pines could get really, really strange, and sometimes those strange things got dangerous. I knelt beside Preston and whispered in his ear, Are you sure you want to do this? I'm 96% sure. 96%? Yes. Preston said. He turned to me and squeezed my hand. For as cold and pretentious as Preston could be, there was a little sweetness in him, like sugar sprinkled on rotten fruit. Just before the man put the tape in the TV, he turned to look at me. Only one at a time, the man said. You'll need to wait your turn. Preston squeezed my hand one last time before letting go. I'll see you soon, he said. Okay, I said. I'll be right outside. I walked out of the tiny room and closed the door behind me. I looked out at the store. It was still empty. I hovered by the comedy section, never straying far from the happy corner. After a minute or so, the man came out and closed the door behind him. He looked at me and smiled, holding his lips in that forced state for an awkward amount of time. It was as if his thoughts had wandered mid-smile. I looked away, but I knew he was still looking at me. Your friend is going to be a changed man after this, he said. He moved closer to me, stepping over boxes and cardboard cutouts. He had giraffe long legs, thin and bendy as vines. He hovered next to me as I thumbed through the videos. He smelled like firewood and sweat, like he'd just come out of the woods. I didn't like him standing close to me. I didn't feel safe. I felt his breath on my neck. I imagined him eating me in a single bite. Can you back up a little? I said. I said... He emphasized. Your friend is going to be different. Is that okay with you? I looked up at him. For a moment, I thought his eyes were glowing, but it was just the fluorescent ceiling lights. It's whatever, I said. I just met him. A new friend. I see, I see. The man reached across my throat and picked up a VHS from the shelf. It was clueless. Do you like comedies? I shook my head. I didn't want to talk. I didn't want him to smell my breath. People look to comedies like they'll bring happiness, but that's not right, the man said. The only way to be happy is to imagine the bad, the strange, the ugly. Looking at happy things will only make you miserable. Preston screamed. I heard it through the closed door. It was fast, but deep. A bottom of the stomach kind of scream. I turned and ran toward the door. The man wrapped his hand on my shoulder, holding me back. I could feel his strength. It was otherworldly. I tried to push past it, but I couldn't. Is he okay? I asked. You'll have your turn, he said. It's important not to mistake the process for the result. I slapped his hand off of me. He raised it in surrender. Sorry, sorry, he said. I don't mean to be touchy. I'm just so happy to have the company. I looked back at the happy corner door. I swear the wood was rumbling. What's happening to him? I asked. The man rubbed his hands together. Nothing's happening to him, but something is happening within him. A transformation. I turned to look at the exit. I wasn't too late. I could still leave. I could run home and jump in my bed and do my best to forget all of this ever happened. But then I thought about Preston. Was he pretentious? Yes. Rude? Yes. A potentially out of this world telepathic freak? Yes. But he was also my friend. My only friend. I didn't know if I was going to get another one in this strange town. But how much longer until he can leave? I asked. The man extended his finger, then dropped one at a time. His video will end in three, two. And like that, the door swung open. Preston exploded out of the room and dropped to his hands and knees, his hair thick with sweat. He couldn't catch his breath. I ran over to him. What happened? He wouldn't look at me. His eyes were fixed on a swirl in the carpet. He's begun the transformation, the man said. Now it's your turn. The man and I helped Preston onto a chair and gave him some water. Preston still wouldn't look at me. He kept his eyes to the ground, his face shifting between exhaustion and relief. 
I wanted to talk to him, but the man wouldn't let me. Every time I tried to speak, he stood in front of me and reminded me of the process. Once Preston regained his breath, the man turned to me. You ready, dear? Was I ready? No. Nope. Definitely not. I felt sick. My arms tingled. I wanted to close my eyes and teleport to anywhere else on Earth. I'd felt like this a few times. One time, on the first day in a new school, I was so nervous I threw up in my backpack. No one saw, so I just walked around with a bag of puke all day. That's how I felt now. But I knew I had to do it. I don't know why I knew that. I just did. The man led me inside and motioned for me to sit in the chair. There was a small puddle of what I hoped was sweat on it. I sat anyway. The man looked down at me. It was a long, uncomfortable stare. He was looking at my hair. I like the buzz cut, he said. I nodded, but he didn't look away. Did you do that yourself? I did, I said. Why? I didn't want to get into the ghost cat dog killer or my mom is a controlling psycho story, so I kept it simple. It's a new me, I said. The man smiled in the dark room. I could only see his teeth and the whites of his eyes. Change is scary, he said. Definitely. But happiness and fear are two sides of the same coin. Sure, right, I said, my voice starting to shake. Thanks, the man laughed, <laughs> then turned his attention to the videos. He scanned them for a moment, then made his selection. He popped the VHS out of its case and slipped it into the TV. Don't leave until it's over, he said. My heart fluttered. What if something goes wrong? I asked. Even if something feels wrong? He said. It's probably right. I didn't know what that meant. All I knew was that it didn't sound good. When the man closed the door, the room got darker. I waved my hand in front of my face. I couldn't see it. It stayed like that for a few seconds. Then the screen flashed. It started as static. Black and white lines chasing each other up and down the glass. It sounded like a bunch of bugs. Maybe the TV is broken. Maybe it won't work for me. Maybe they're playing a trick on me. I should go out. I should go get the man and tell him it's over. That I'm done. That I'm just not cut out for the happy corner. Yes, good idea, Emma. Just as I stood up, the image changed. I saw my reflection, but... It wasn't a normal reflection. I saw myself sitting in the room, but it was as if I was being filmed. The camera zoomed in on me. It went closer and closer to my body, then my face, then my eyes. It got so close that, eventually, I couldn't see. My eyes and the screen became one. Then I was gone. I opened my eyes. It was bright and sunny. I was standing in the middle of a cul-de-sac, surrounded by houses. Neighbors watered their plants and pushed their kids on bikes. One of them waved to me. It was a man with his daughter. I didn't wave back. After a moment, I realized he wasn't waving to me at all. There was another neighbor behind me. She waved back, her face painfully bright. I knew this neighborhood. It was the one by the lake, the one with our very first house the one I'd lived in for the longest time, up until I was eight. It was the only house I had good memories from. I turned to see if it was still there. It was, just as sleepy and homely as it has always been. Looking at it now, it hadn't changed one bit. I saw my dad's New York Yankees flag, his motorcycle in the driveway, my chalk drawings of suns and fish on the driveway. I heard a fizzing sound and looked up. Something appeared in the blue sky. They looked like massive balloons twisted in the shape of letters. They scrolled across the sky, one letter at a time. D-A-D-D-Y-S-L-I-T-T-L-E-G-I-R-L. -T -T -E Daddy's Little Girl. It looked like the title sequence in a movie, and... After a moment, I realized that's exactly what it was. I was inside of a movie. Stay calm, Emma. 
I whispered. It didn't work. Sweat ran down my neck as I turned from house to house, looking for a clue, an escape. Stay calm, Emma. Was this some sort of game? Riddle? Illusion? Did the man slip some sort of goggles on my head? I touched my face. Nothing was there. It was just me in this world. The real world, but not quite. Real, but imagined. Real, but terrifying. I ran over to the closest person. It was our old neighbor, Miss Baker. She was older than my parents, with kids who had already grown up. She was always working on her garden, and this day was no different. She was pouring water on a sunflower. It was our old neighbor, Miss Barker. Miss Barker? I said, running up to her. What's going on? She didn't look at me. I shook her arm, and the water went everywhere, but she didn't look up. She kept the same stupid, blissful smile. Miss Barker, hello? I shook her more. She didn't look at me. But then, as if on cue, she raised her head and looked behind me. Hello? She looked over my shoulder. I turned. I screamed. The man was twice my size and emanated a sound so loud my hearing cut out. It was louder than anything I'd ever heard, like a hundred engines firing off at once. I couldn't see his face or eyes or body, but I knew where the sound was coming from. He was covered in thousands and thousands of bugs. Ah! I tripped back over the sunflowers and crawled away from him. Some of the bugs followed me, then retreated back to the pile. Oh, they were so loud, the loudest bugs I'd ever encountered. Their voices high-pitched and screaming, polluting the quiet neighborhood. The man didn't move. He didn't wave. He didn't talk. He just stood there, across from Miss Barker. She kept blabbering, oblivious to the monster in front of her. How have you been, Dave? She went on. Dave? Dave? Could it be? Dad? I said. The man stayed still. The bugs crawled in his mouth through his eyes, across every inch of skin. Every few seconds, a cloud of them leapt off him, swirled about, and then attached onto a different section of his body. I wasn't a bug expert, but I had a small phase as a girl. These looked like cicadas. I didn't know which kind exactly, but they were as big as my thumb, with wild, flapping wings. And they were loud. It was like sticking my head in an airplane engine. I flinched. Something was in my ear. I slapped my head until the bug fell out. It crawled around, half paralyzed in the grass. The man took a step closer to me. I stood up and walked backwards through Miss Barker's lawn. I didn't know where to go. My house was there, but I didn't know what was inside. It could have been a thousand times worse. The man kept walking toward me. Some of the bugs swirled around Miss Barker's bob, then flew off. She didn't notice. The man wasn't moving fast, but he was definitely moving. Each step was another second I lost to escape. I looked around the neighborhood. The backyards butted against a highway. I could run deeper in the neighborhood, but that didn't solve my problem. The man said to stay until it was over. But what was over? What if over was hundreds of years away? I looked back at my house. I knew the game put me here on purpose. This was no accident. I was scared of this house because I loved it so much. I thought it was going to be the only house I ever lived in. So I put my whole heart into it. I had my height scribbled on a door frame. Dad and I built a tree house in the backyard. We knew all the neighbors. It was more than a house. It was my first and only home. And that's what made it so scary. It taught me how easily the things you loved could disappear. I ran up to the front door. Locked. I tried the back door. No luck. I looked back. The bug man was getting closer. I tried the windows, the garage, the cellar door, the doggy door. Nope, nope, nope. I was running out of options and time. The man was in the driveway now. The bugs were getting louder. I ran toward the backyard. Our treehouse was still there, tall and poorly built and totally mine. I ran up to the ladder and climbed. The inside of the treehouse was perfectly preserved. 
I had Spice Girls posters on the wall and a small library of Goosebumps books. The windows were made out of old stained glass my dad got from a church they were tearing down. Bright, colorful light filled the room as the buzzing slowly got closer. I ran my hands along the shelves and floor. I never appreciated the amount of detail dad put into it. I thought all dads just knew how to build flawless buildings with little effort. But this was different. He hand carved my name in the molding, along with images from my favorite childhood stories. The Three Little Pigs, Little Red Riding Hood, Goldilocks. The whole room was an homage to my imagination. And, in a way, dad's imagination too. A knocking threw me out of my trance. The bug sounds hadn't moved closer, but someone was here. I crawled into the corner and hugged my knees. I closed my eyes. I prayed my death would be quick. They knocked again. Then, a voice. Emma, dear. The voice said. Can I come in? It was him. I hadn't heard his voice in years, but I knew it was him. Dad? You ran up here so fast. He said. Are you mad at me? I flipped back the plywood door, and Dad popped his head up. I was thrown back by how young he looked. In the last picture I saw of him, his hairline was receding, and he had a big, ugly beard. Here, he had a small mustache and curly hair that fell to his shoulders. His smile was so bright it made my stomach hurt. Where's Daddy's little girl running off to? I couldn't speak. I tried to smile, but I couldn't move my face without crying. I hadn't cried in years. I forgot what it felt like. Oh, no. Come here, dear. He said. Dad crawled in and wiped the tears off my face. He smelled familiar, but in a sad way. It was the same way the end of summer smelled. What happened to the bugs? I asked. I peeked over the edge and looked down. There were still a few bugs circling his legs. Bugs? He asked. I couldn't tell if he was joking. You were covered in bugs. I said. It happens sometimes. He said. Don't you ever get covered in bugs? I shook my head. I'd never been covered in bugs. But I'd been covered in some things, I guess. In the days leading up to my suicide attempt, I felt like I was covered in a black cloth. Like the light had to go through cotton to reach me. When I was in the hospital, I felt like I was covered in ice packs. I couldn't move without shivering. I don't know if that was the nerves or the fear or the medication they had me on, but bugs? I had never been covered in bugs. It's not so bad, he said, rubbing my knee. They always go away. A few flew up and landed by my feet. They crawled around aimlessly. I don't want to be covered in bugs, I said. Dad smiled. I never thought much about his smile in those days. I always thought he was a cheery person, but now I know he was hiding something. Those smiles weren't real. On the day he left, he packed up his clothes in a backpack and slipped on a leather jacket he just bought. I was sitting in the living room, watching him. Mom was grocery shopping. He knelt down in front of me and wrapped me in a big hug. I gotta go, he said. When will you be back? I asked. He leaned back, keeping his hands on my shoulders. His eyes looked strange, like they were heavier than normal. You'll see me around, he said. Take care of your mom for me. I tilted my head to the side. Dad laughed. You look like a confused puppy, he said. Don't worry about me. I wasn't worried about him. I was confused and scared and nervous. I, I didn't want to mow the lawn or cook dinner or have to earn money. I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to do anything. Dad snapped his fingers in my face. I was back in the treehouse. Earth to Emma, he said. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? I asked. In the years following his disappearance, I would get an occasional letter or phone call. He always said he had to talk through three different towns to get a hold of us. It was true. Every time we moved, our last phone number got further and further away. Eventually, Dad stopped trying. But in the treehouse, Dad was here, just as I remembered him. He hadn't left yet. Where did I go? He asked. I nodded. <laughs> Dad laughed. Oh, Emma, Emma, Emma. He said, shaking his head. I went to the same place you went. 
I tilted my head, the same way I did when I was a little girl. What do you mean? Dad leaned in and whispered. We have the same disease, you and I. He said. Remember how you felt before your incident? How did he know about my incident? Not even present day dad knew about it. Remember how it felt like people couldn't see you? He went on. I nodded. That's because you were gone. Dad said. You and me, we have the disappearing disease. But where did you physically go? I asked. You left me. You physically left me, not mentally. Where did you go? What happened? You need to tell me. Dad smiled. It made me angry. Really angry. I could feel the blood run through my arms. It pulsed through my chest and down into my legs. It was bubbling hot. Stop smiling, I said. Just tell me. You're going there again. He said. What? You're starting to disappear. Stop ignoring the question! The bugs by my feet multiplied. There was a dozen of them now, all swarming the treehouse. I tried to swat them away, but they kept coming. Make them stop! I yelled. You're gonna get covered again! It was getting louder and louder. The buzzing filled my ear. They're not coming for me this time. What? I reached out to him, but I couldn't see him anymore. The bugs were on my face. I swatted at them, but they kept coming. First a few, then dozens, then hundreds. I opened my mouth to yell, but I couldn't. As soon as I did, the bugs flew inside. I gasped and bit for air. One exploded in my mouth, a bitter goo falling down my throat, the crunchy shell piercing my gums. I tried to spit it out, but more flew in. I punched, I kicked. It kept covering me more and more and more until it was total darkness, total screaming, total creepy, crawly sensation. My dad's voice somehow made it through the ringing. Just relax. The bugs were making a home in my skin. I tried to swat them away, but it was useless. I tried to stand, but that was useless too. I might have been on my feet, but I couldn't tell. My balance felt different. I took a step forward. If I made it to the ladder, I could climb down and then maybe the bugs would leave. Maybe I would find the end of the game. More than anything, I was desperate to get them off of me. I was desperate to get home. My foot hit the first rung. I swung my arm, searching for something to grab onto. I grabbed a shelf. I took another step. But this time, there was nothing to land on. My center of gravity tipped backward. I was falling, fast. I was waiting for the impact, for death, for my head to explode as it hit the grass, for the bugs to find their opening and crawl through my wounds, to become me, to overtake me, to make me one of them. Just before I hit the ground, a few bugs cleared from my face. I looked up. Dad was still in the treehouse, looking down at me. He was smiling, totally free of bugs. I hated the way his lips curled, the way his eyes brightened, the way his teeth shined. Every bug he shed, I gained. Just as I felt the ground hit my back, everything went dark. I landed on my hands and knees outside the happy corner door. I gasped and spit for air. The bugs were gone. The sour taste was gone. I could breathe again. Preston ran up to me with a glass of water. He laughed as he rubbed my back. He told me to drink. The owner of the store was standing behind him, leaning on an end cap with his arms crossed over his chest. He was laughing too. What was so funny? Why were they so happy? <laughs> Crazy in there, right? Preston said. I took the water and chucked. When it was empty, I tossed it on the carpet and crawled away from him. I kept rubbing my arms, checking for cicadas. When I opened my eyes, I saw the world again. It lingered in my brain. I tried not to blink. You're safe now, Preston said. I didn't believe him. How could I? How could an old TV do something so powerful, then just stop? It wasn't over. I don't know how I knew it, but I did. Whatever power existed in that box was just beginning. I looked up at the video store owner. He was smiling. I wanted to grab the corners of his mouth and pull until his face ripped off. I'm a kid! I screamed. How could you do that to me? Preston backed up. I had never heard my voice get so loud. I felt like my stomach was tearing open and a dark power was bubbling to the surface. 
the man knelt down to my level. His face didn't change. My power was useless against his. His voice was soft, but forceful. When you're lying in your bed tonight, I want you to think about the place you went, he said. Then, I want you to look around your room. I guarantee you it will be the happiest moment of your entire life. I crawled away from him. I didn't care about his little theories. I didn't care about the happy corner or Preston or the stupid town. I just wanted to get home. I just wanted to see my mom. I wanted to bury my head in my bed and count the seconds until we moved on to our next town, one with less demons and witches and murdering ghost cats and haunted video stores. I stood up and walked down the next aisle toward the exit. Preston ran up and grabbed my arm. I shook him off of me. Don't follow me, I said. Preston took a step back. He tried to wipe the smile off his face, but it sprung back. I'm sorry, Emma. Really, I'm... I don't know. You don't know what? I turned toward him. He couldn't stop smiling. Tell me, I said. What don't you know? I thought you knew everything, every perfect word, every person's thoughts. So please, enlighten me. What don't you know? Preston raised his hands in surrender. He wouldn't look me in the eyes. He kept them down on the candy bars. I've never felt like this before. He said. This, I don't know. Happy? Yes. He said. This happy with you, with this place, with everything. I don't want you to be mad at me. I just need a minute, I said. Maybe I'll see you around town. I turned and walked out the door. Outside, the air was thick and humid. Summer was coming over the hills. The sun bright and painful. I couldn't make it a few steps without hearing a bug. Every time I did, I punched the air. As I made it to the end of the parking lot, a familiar car ripped up the road. It was Mom. She pulled up in front of me and rolled down the window. There's my delinquent, she said. I rolled my eyes and kept walking. But just as I did, I felt deep dread. Something was different about her. I stepped back and looked again. No. Mom, I said. Why are you wearing that shirt? Oh. Now you're so curious about my life? Mom, I repeated. Why are you wearing that shirt? Mom grabbed the tape head video logo from her green polo and lifted it toward me. Marjorie and her brother own the place, she said. She hired me this morning. That's Marjorie's brother? They're such a nice family, Mom said. They've really helped us out. You can't work there, I said. Oh, Mom said, leaning toward me. Miss Independent wants to tell other people how to live their lives. How interesting. Mom, you can't work there, I said. It's a bad place. The man will seem one way, but it is actually... Oh, by the way, Mom said, checking her makeup in the mirror. Marjorie's dog got hit by a car last night. She asked if you saw anyone drive off. I told her you did a little late night exploring and might have seen something. I had too many thoughts. I was seconds away from crying or screaming or kicking mom's car. I walked away as mom kept talking. She yelled that I was a brat, then drove off. I walked home, climbed the stairs, then plopped right onto the bed. The sun was still high in the sky, my walls nearly sweating from the humidity. I inspected my surroundings. All of the previous night's damage disappeared, as if the walls soaked it up like a sponge. I rubbed my temples and tried to keep my eyes open for as long as possible. Every time I closed them, I saw it. The treehouse, the bugs, my dad's stupid face. I didn't want to remember that dad. I wanted to remember who he really was. I got up and searched through my boxes. Dad's picture was packed away with my old school folders. I pulled it out and stared at him. The real him. An old neighbor printed it off a mugshot website. She kept pressing my mom to talk about her ex-husband, then searched online until she found a picture of him. She printed it out and left it on our doorstep, as if we'd been searching for him too. Apparently, he was drunk in a biker bar in South Dakota and punched an off-duty cop. His face was bloated and sad, never quite looking at the camera. I laid the picture on my chest and stared at the ceiling. 
As I did, I heard a familiar sound on the floorboards. Lisa, the ghost cat, was back. But this time, I wasn't scared by her. In fact, I was happy. Stupid happy. Happier than I had ever been. I held Dad to my chest and listened to the soft sound of Lisa's paws. I started laughing. I couldn't stop. Each new breath was a wildfire of gasps and cackles and tears. Bright feelings clawed out of my stomach and infected every nerve, every organ, every particle. As I remembered the bugs and the treehouse, I felt incredible. I was safe. I was bug-free. I was back in the real world. I kept laughing as the sun slowly set. At some point, I fell asleep. My mouth opened and lips stretched in a smile. My fingers were sticky from the kettle corn. I tried to wipe the sugar off on my pants, but it seemed to travel further up my arm, moving like an invisible wave of syrup spiders. I looked down at the rest of the bag Preston brought me, it was the length of my entire body. I felt a rush of paranoia. There was no reason to be nervous. The sun was bright and warm. I was at a carnival. People were smiling. Kids screeched on the rides. But for some reason, I got a bad feeling. Twin Pines seemed to bring that out of me. Well, how's your popcorn? Preston asked. I smiled but didn't say anything. I don't know why he brought me this kettle corn. In fact, he didn't just buy me kettle corn. He picked out the biggest bag they had. Maybe he felt bad for bringing me to the video store last week. Maybe he thought I was still upset. In his defense, I had been ignoring him ever since. When I got home that night, I vowed to avoid him at all costs. I blamed him for the horrible time I had in there. I knew it wasn't his fault, but he wasn't totally blameless. When he came out of that room, he could have at least warned me. For the week following, he came to my house every day. He threw rocks at my window. He bugged mom at work. Each time, I ignored him, even though I had exactly zero friends. I didn't want my only friend to be a cigarette-smoking, half-psychic psycho. Still, when I watched the carnival trucks come into town, I felt sad. Every morning, I had the uncontrollable urge to dig my face in my pillow and cry. I was, what the experts call, lonely. So, when he came to my house this morning, I went downstairs and said hello. He looked at me and smiled. Carnival? He asked. I could tell he was trying to stay casual. I guess he didn't want to look as rejected as he felt. Sure, I said. Mom walked out of the kitchen and looked at me for a moment. She was in her tape head video polo. For the last week, we'd been waging a silent war. We weren't exactly buddy-buddy, but I liked to think she liked how much I'd been staying home. We ate dinner in silence, but we weren't arguing. We'd chew and stare out the window and listen to the low sound of the TV in the background. But as I passed her to go with Preston, she sighed, a disappointed sound. Oh, what about taking it easy tonight? She said. We could watch a movie. There was a warmth in her voice, but I didn't exactly trust it. I smiled and waved goodbye. I'll be home later, I said. As I walked out the door, I heard her toss her coffee mug into the sink. Don't punish me for being nice, she snapped then disappeared into the kitchen. Hello? Preston asked, nudging me with his elbow. I shook myself into the present. What? I asked if you'd like popcorn. He said. Yeah, for sure. I said, sucking the sugar off my fingers before shoving another handful into my face. He laughed. Are you going to eat it all just so I can't have a bite? Again, I nodded. We were standing by the entrance of the carnival, the swarms of out-of-towners rushing by. I had never seen so many people in Twin Pines before. From what Preston explained on the walk over, 
The Twin Pines Carnival was a bit infamous around these parts. Every year, a kid goes missing, he said. We were walking down Main Street when he told me. I looked up at the distant attractions. I could see the circle of fire ride above the tree line. Missing? Yep, and for whatever reason, each year the carnival gets more popular. As we walked, I watched the traffic back up. There must have been a hundred cars. The eager family sat in a long line between Main Street and the fairgrounds. Although, fairgrounds was a bit generous. It was a big square carved in a cornfield. That's not real though, right? I asked. There's no way a kid actually goes missing every year. Preston bit off a fingernail and spit it into the grass. Oh, it's real. Every year? For the last five years, yeah. I mean, I guess technically it could have happened after the fair, or on the ride home, or back at their houses. No one really knows, right? Parents could be killing their kids and using the carnival as an excuse, but either way, a police report always goes back to the fair. I kept my attention on the cars. If I'd looked at Preston, I might start to believe his stupid urban legend. I already had enough things to be paranoid about. As the sun baked down on the cars, the carnival came more into view. It looked innocent enough, no different than the dozen other carnivals I'd been to in my life. Every once in a while, someone would honk or yell out their window or toss trash by our feet. Preston would flip them off and yell that the earth was dying, which made the kids laugh. I didn't engage with them the way he did. Instead, I quietly stared at the happy families, the kids bouncing on the back seats, the moms smoking cigarettes, the dads blasting sports radios. Did they know they were inching toward their doom? Or was that a part of the thrill? So you're not nervous about getting abducted? I asked. Preston paused for a moment. Screams echoed in the distance. I could see more of the roller coasters now. They rose above the trees like abandoned monsters. I watched one of the roller coasters as its flimsy cart peeked over a drop. A dozen sets of hands raised in the air. There's probably, what, a thousand people that come here every year? Maybe two thousand? That's pretty good odds. That's not much more dangerous than dying on a roller coaster. I guess, I said. As much as I wanted to believe him, I knew the math wasn't on our side. Out of the hundreds of carnivals that happen every summer and the thousands and thousands of people who attend them, how many people really died on the roller coasters? One in a million? That didn't make me nervous. But one in a thousand chance of vanishing into thin air? That made me a little nervous. I finished a quarter of the kettle corn before giving up. I offered Preston the rest in solidarity, but he said no. He pointed to his incredibly thin stomach, as if the popcorn would somehow ruin his perfect shape. I rolled my eyes and threw the rest in the trash. As we walked through the crowd, I marveled at how alive our sleepy town had become. Food stands smoked, scents of fat and salt wafted in the air. Carnival games rang with shouts of winners and losers of pop balloons and squirting guns. Kids screamed as rides rose and descended, twisted and turned, shook and spun. Everything was bright and sweet. As we navigated the happy chaos, my paranoia slowly left. From the looks on everyone's smiling faces, no kids had been abducted yet. But as always, my good feeling didn't last long. I recognized her instantly. Her short hair and dark eyes and curved posture. She was outside the carousel ride in a ticket taker uniform. Even though her shirt was bright yellow, there was a darkness to her, a morning fog. I tried to ignore her, but she saw me right away. It was like she had been watching me since I first walked in. Emma, Marjorie said, thank you for coming to my carnival. I stopped walking and looked around. Your carnival? I organize it, yes, she said. Just one of my many ventures. She spoke with a strict matter-of-factness, like she was a school principal. That's so cool, I said, starting to walk away. 
Well, it's good to see you. She reached out and grabbed my shoulder. Her hand was cold, even through my shirt. The chill ran through my body. You don't know what happened to my dog, do you? Sorry? A few weeks ago, my dog was murdered, she said. Your mom says you were out that night. You don't know anything about it, though, do you? I closed my eyes, tried to look like I was remembering something, even though the memory was fresh in my mind. The dead dog was in the middle of the road. I saw its closed eyes, its empty frown, its matted fur. Yeah, I was out that night, yeah, I said. I needed some air and maybe saw something, but you know, I, I didn't want to pry and what do they say? Tall walls make good neighbors. People say that, right? A group of kids passed Marjorie their tickets, but she kept her eyes on me the whole time. The edge of her smirk curled up. She knew something. I looked at Preston. He was staring at her, his eyes squinted. Hey, Emma. He said. I had way too much popcorn, and I think I'm going to be sick. Can you come with me to the bathroom? Marjorie kept her gaze on me. Go help your friend, she said. And if you remember anything, you know where to find me. I know where to find you, too. We should probably go, I said, elbowing Preston. Come on. Oh, before you go, Marjorie said, pulling something out of her pocket. It was two tickets. Come back to the carousel later. First ride's on me. I don't want any tall walls between us. Preston tugged my shirt and I followed him, stuffing the tickets into my pocket. Once we got out of earshot, he put his hands on my shoulders and stopped me. Who is that woman? He asked. I hadn't seen him look this way before. Sweat ran down his forehead. My neighbor, I said. He nodded, working to catch his breath. Did you hear something? I asked. Preston's gift wasn't something we really talked about. I knew it was there, lingering in the periphery like a nosy neighbor. But looking at his eyes, I knew it had flared. He heard something. Yes, and no, I don't know. It was like, I don't know how to explain it. She said something to me. She talked to me. Talked to you? He rubbed his temples and winced. Yes. What did she say? Preston chewed on his fingertips. People were looking at us. She said, hello. I laughed. Of all the horrible curses and omens and death threats, of all the shadowy creatures Marjorie could have summoned, she said, hello? That's it? I asked. Before he could respond, something knocked me off my feet. I collapsed into Preston, who grabbed me before I hit the ground. As he got me back on my feet, I looked to see the idiot kid who hit me. But it wasn't a kid. It was a full-grown man. The man was twice my size, with a shiny bald head. He stood up and slapped the dust off his pants. As soon as he did, he balled them back into fists. Excuse me, I said. He didn't turn back to apologize. Instead, he moved toward a small crowd and pumped his chest. They had their hands up in surrender, except for one. One of the men was looking right at the bald man, his chest just as wide. He had thinning gray hair and angry, beady eyes. Don't put your hands on me, the gray-haired man said. Stop spouting this shit. You're scaring the kids. They need to be scared. No one needs your conspiracy bullshit. My son is... The gray-haired man didn't finish. He leapt toward the barrel-chested bald guy. His fist wound up. As the man's knuckles collided with the other's face, people gasped and swarmed. The crowd of parents descended on the bald guy, which caused bystanders to jump in. Within a moment, dozens of people had formed a circle around the grown men. People screamed, teenagers cheered, food vendors laughed and threw french fries at the brawl. Preston wrapped me in a hug and pulled me away. As we glided away from the madness, a woman ran up to me and shoved a flyer into my hands. Preston tried to shoo her away, but I took it anyway. She was from the original group of parents, the ones the bald guy was attacking. 
She had big, sad eyes. As I took her flyer, she stared at me, her mouth moving in a strange way, like she was eating the air. Security guards ran beside us, pushing the woman back into the swarm. I kept looking at her. There was something tragic about her. Her yellow teeth, the veins around her eyes, the way her mouth never settled on a sentence. As she moved further from me, it felt like she was sinking. Like she was drowning in midair. Like her world was unsuitable for human life. Preston pulled me to an opening, but our small refuge was closing in. Around us, people ran to join the fight. They were mad with excitement, like the fight was another attraction. Let's get out of here, Preston said. I looked ahead. The exit was a long way away. I felt like everything was closing in, like the carnival was going to swallow me whole. I stuffed the woman's flyer in my pocket, and when I did, I felt something else. Marjorie's tickets. I know where we can get some space, I said. I took Preston's hand and led him toward the carousel. As I saw the spinning vessel, Marjorie was standing in front of it, looking right at me. She didn't look surprised. In fact, she looked very pleased. I had a feeling you'd be back, she said. I didn't look at her. When I handed her the ticket, she grabbed them with both of her hands. I felt the cold coming off of her. I have fun, she said. I pushed past her and ascended the ramp, pulling Preston behind me. We were the only two people on the ride. As we searched the plastic horses for our steeds, I studied their eyes. They were frozen, staring off into the carnival, paralyzed in a flash of excitement. While they charged toward nothing, I noticed a painting on the center of the carousel. The faded portrait showed scenes of cheering children. There was something off about their faces, though. Their arms raised in celebration. But their faces were stoic, the muscles totally still. If it wasn't for their flailing arms, they almost looked dead. Preston settled on a pink and purple unicorn. I jumped on the one beside it, a white horse with black spots. A sort of horse cow. Well, that was chaotic, Preston said, looking back at the brawl. It was starting to settle down. The group of flyer-wielding parents were being escorted out of the park. Seriously? What were they selling? He pointed at the flyer in my pocket. I pulled it out, and as I unfolded it, five faces greeted me. They were all children. Three boys and two girls. They looked younger than us, ranging between six and twelve. The top of the page read, Have you seen me? in big, bold letters. I handed it to Preston. As he studied it, I looked back at the painting. I couldn't get past the kids' faces. How did the artist capture such a distant stare? How did he or she find subjects with looks of such disassociation? Yeah, these are the missing kids, Preston said. That's sad, I said, but I wasn't really listening. I couldn't stop looking at the painting. At first, I thought it was a big crowd of children, but that wasn't right. The painting repeated the same panel as it went around the carousel. In reality, the scene consisted of the same five children. Three boys, two girls. Marjorie's voice came over the loudspeaker. Take off in three, two, and... The ride jolted to life. Preston let go of the flyer and grabbed onto the unicorn's horn. I watched the paper fly in the breeze before drifting into a collection of old metal gates. I tried to breathe, but my mind was racing. Three boys, two girls. It was a coincidence, sure, but as I learned from my time in Twin Pines, this town had very few coincidences. As we moved in the circle, music came over the loudspeaker. It was an old-timey carnival song, a man singing in a strange voice backed by a stand-up bass and twangy guitar. We kept moving in our circle. The people outside grew blurry. I looked over to Preston. He was smiling, as if to comfort me. You're white as a ghost. You okay? 
I nodded. I didn't realize I looked as unsettled as I felt. It wasn't just the music, or Marjorie, or the strange paintings on the wall. There was another gloom taking over, a cold wind blowing. Maybe I should get off, I said. The music got louder. Preston nodded, but I don't think he heard me. Did you hear me? I yelled. What? My hands were slippery with sweat. I tried to keep a grip on the handle, but I was slipping. I looked over to Marjorie, but it was hard to make her out amongst the blurs. Carousels weren't supposed to be this fast. It felt like I was riding a real horse. I waved to Marjorie again. Nothing. I needed this ride to stop. If it didn't, I was going to spew the kettle. Even the thought of the kettle corn made me... Stop the... I swallowed a wave of puke. Oh no. Here it comes. I closed my eyes and tried to picture stable ground, but everything was spinning, even my thoughts. I needed Marjorie to see me. Maybe if she saw someone getting off their horse, she would stop the ride. It wasn't my brightest idea, but I was running out of options. One more rotation and the puke wouldn't stay down. I leapt off the cow horse and landed on the platform. I kept my hand on the handle as my center of gravity fought to adjust. I waved my arm again. Marjorie! I swallowed another wave of puke. I kept waving my arms, but nothing. I turned to look at Preston. He had become a blur too. Somehow, the painting on the wall was crystal clear. The cheering children were still as ever. I took a step toward Marjorie. The music grew to a new high. I could feel it in my eyes. I waved to Marjorie again. Still no response. I knew I couldn't get her attention so far anyway. I needed to move toward her. I looked back at my hand. Beyond every bit of instinct, I released my grip. My plan instantly backfired. Within a second, my balance folded. As I fell backward, I reached again for the handle, but it was gone. I was falling back toward the platform, the speed increasing another notch. As I hit the metal platform, I slid away from my horse. I screamed, but it was useless. I was gliding at a terrifying speed, a speed unfit for humans. If I hit the ground at this speed, my bones would snap like popsicle sticks. I couldn't feel the platform anymore. I was airborne. Next stop was the ground, 10 feet below the platform. I closed my eyes and braced for impact. But when I opened my eyes, my bones weren't shattered. My head wasn't split open. My body wasn't twisted like a rag doll. I was fine, perfectly fine even, maybe better than before. My nausea was gone and the sweet, sickly taste of the kettle corn was off my lips. I was on my way back beside the carousel, which had rolled to a stop. I stared up at the sky. The sun had lowered behind the trees, leaving a cotton candy streak across the clouds. The air was cool, and the carnival was. Quiet? I sat up and looked. Everyone was gone. I stood up and walked down the carnival's main drag, the sizzle of hot dogs and smell of smoke were gone. The rickety roll of coasters had vanished. The parents of the missing children weren't handing out flyers. Even Marjorie was gone. It was just me and the shells of the day's fun, massive, unmanned machines, and the breeze whistling through the metal. I turned in a circle as I called out, Preston? Hello? Are you there? I walked down the torn up cornfield as I yelled. I rubbed my temples. It felt like I had a concussion. Everything had a blur to it, like I was looking at it through a glass of water. As I walked, I noticed something in the distance. It was an animal, small and scraggly, running across my path. It scurried between the booths, glancing back at me as it hid behind a funnel cake cart. It had black fur and an arched back. I ran over to get a better look. When I found it, it was hiding behind the wheel, staring up at me. I recognized it right away. Lisa kept her eyes on me as she backed away. I reached out to pet her, but she hissed, her eyes wild. Her frail body began to shake, but I couldn't tell if it was from anger or fear. Her collar jingled in the wind. 
Lisa. It's me, I said. Emma, I'm the one who found you the other night. After seeing her so large and violent, then so small and dead, her normal, living state struck me as the most odd. I didn't understand how something could travel between such drastic states of being. She was ice, then water, then vapor, her atoms colliding in violent, magical ways. I leaned down again to try to pet her, but this time she ran off. I stood up and looked around for more signs of life. <sighs> Freaking out won't help, I said. I started to hyperventilate. Just stay calm. I listened to my voice. It sounded strange. I turned back to the carousel. They appeared out of thin air. Preston was walking off the ride, turning side to side, calling my name. Marjorie was standing by the entrance. She acted like she couldn't hear him. Her expression was perfectly still, unfazed. Hey, it's me, hello! I yelled, running over. Marjorie glanced at me for a moment, then looked back at Preston. He had an aurora around him, a sort of pink cloud. It was like looking at someone through a kaleidoscope. Where's Emma? He asked Marjorie. I tried to grab his shoulders, and my hands went right through him. Where's who? Marjorie asked. I looked at her. Again, she looked at me for a moment, then back to Preston. She saw me. I know she did. What did you do to me? I asked her. You saw us go on the ride together, Preston said. She said she was feeling sick, and all of a sudden she was gone. Well, maybe you should check the bathrooms, Marjorie said. I stared at her, scrunching my face to look as mean as possible. I knew she saw me. I could tell in the way she talked like a parent lying about Santa Claus. It was in the way she smiled, too. The edge of her mouth curled ever so slightly. Subtle as the seraph on the edge of a curse word. You can see me, I said. Marjorie didn't look over. Hello? I know you see me! Hello? 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 Stop doing that! Preston yelled. He moved back and put his hands around his head. He was in pain. Preston? I lowered myself to match his eyes. He still didn't see me. Preston, hello, it's me. You need to help me. Are you having a headache? Marjorie asked, stepping closer to him. Preston looked up at her, his eyes narrowed. How are you doing that? He asked. Doing what? Preston, listen, I said. Can you hear me? Hello? 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 Stop it! You're in my head! Stop! He yelled. I'm sorry, Marjorie said. She reached out to him, and he jumped away from her. Hello! It's me, Preston! Hello! Hello! I yelled. He stumbled back and collapsed. As he lay on the ground, the dirt beside him kicked up. There were footprints beside him. He was looking up at the air. Somehow the air picked him back up. He's having some sort of episode, Marjorie said to the empty space. Maybe we should call an ambulance. Preston looked around him. He pushed at the invisible people of the other world. The world I was no longer a part of. As he ran away from me, the dirt kicked up in his wake, like the air was chasing him. After a moment of running, he vanished. I kept my back to Marjorie for a moment. Everything grew quiet again. All I heard were her long, deep breaths. What did you do to me? I asked. I turned to face her. She looked at me and smiled, the space around her pupils filled with a dark color, mud spilling into water. You seem to think this is a gay, she whispered. Lucky for you, I like games. Her voice dropped an octave. I felt it in my stomach. What? I asked. I stepped away from her. Marjorie laughed. It rumbled through the ground, shaking the machines as it filled every sound molecule. I kept moving away from her. Then I turned around and started to run. The sound of her laughter filled my brain. I couldn't escape it. 
It flooded every nerve ending. As I ran, the distance between us stayed the same. I pumped my arms and legs, but I wasn't moving. It was like running in a dream. When I exhausted myself, I fell to the ground. I turned and looked up at her. Somehow, she'd grown taller. It wasn't much taller, just a few inches. But it was enough to scare me. Why are you doing this to me? I asked. Marjorie took a step closer. She was standing over me now, her ticket taker shirt flapping in the wind. Have you ever seen a cat play with a mouse before it dies? She asked. What? It will toss it in the air or run with it in its mouth. Those cats are strong, you know. If it wanted to, it could kill that mouse in an instant. But it doesn't. Do you know why? In the distance, the sun fell below the trees. Dark clouds took its place, filling the sky like a gray wave. The temperature dropped. I just want to go home, I said. I wanted to cry, but I held it in. I didn't want her to have my fear. I bit my lip and looked her in the eyes. It doesn't kill the mouse because it wants to hold on to its feeling of power. And power only exists when something else is suffering, she said. Mouse dies, power dies. The clouds moved quickly over the carnival. Rain fell into the dirt. The bright summer day shifted to something out of late October. Marjorie smiled down at me as her head slowly shifted to a long, oval shape. Her teeth were gray and worn down, almost fang-like. I imagined myself inside of her mouth, whirling and kicking and begging to be free. Marjorie smiled down at me as her head slowly shifted. Our cat and mouse game is just beginning, she said, leaning down to touch my arm. She was nearly growling, but don't be sad. Sometimes, against all odds, the mouse wins. Behind her, a small group emerged from the shadows of the machines. There were five of them. They were short and weak-looking, their bodies half the size of mine. As they walked closer, I began to recognize them. There were three boys and two girls. The children formed a half-circle behind Marjorie. They were looking down at me in the dirt, their heads slightly turned to the side. Does she get a turn at the dart game? One of the boys asked. I studied them as they studied me. The two girls were holding hands. One had bright, red hair, and the other blonde. They were equally pale, like they hadn't been outside in years. The redhead was smiling at me, overly excited. The blonde girl kept her eyes on the dirt. They were no older than six or seven. As for the boys, they kept to their own pack, taking turns poking each other. The oldest of the bunch was a little younger than me, probably twelve or so. He was twice as tall as the other boys, flaunting his height in the way he looked down on them. The other boys were younger, six or seven as well. One of them had a shaved head and crystal blue eyes. The last boy was the shortest of everyone, with pudgy arms and a baby face. He, like the blonde girl, kept his eyes on the dirt. The tall boy spoke again. It's only fair she gets to play. We all got one turn. Marjorie turned back and raised her hand. The kids seemed to shrink in size. The tall boy's confidence folded in half. Speak when spoken to, children. Don't be rude. Sorry, Miss Marjorie the boy said. The kids moved closer together. The girls extended their hands to the boys, who grabbed them instantly. They acted like a single, frightened creature. A beast with five heads. What's the game? I asked. Marjorie looked down at me. Stand up, she ordered. I did as I was told. As I stood, she stepped closer to me. Somehow, she kept growing in height. I was shorter than her chin now. The game, she said, laughing. She put her finger in her mouth and bit down on it. She wiggled it around, mimicking the screams of a trapped mouse. Then she opened her mouth. The finger mouse scurried off, flailing with the rest of her fingers as she moved her hand toward the sky. 
The rules are simple, she said. Hit the right balloon, and you go free. Hit the wrong balloon, and, well, she peered back at the five children, then leaned toward me, whispering in my ear, hit the wrong balloon, and you better get real, real comfortable here. I looked up at her face, which had continued to morph. She looked like a painting recovered from a flooded basement. Her features shrank in some places, but expanded in others. The Marjorie I'd been seeing was a mask. Something was waiting underneath. I lifted my chin and looked her in the eyes. Okay, I said. I want to play. Before the word got out, Marjorie snapped her fingers and everything changed. I was in front of a carnival game on the far side of the fairgrounds. The kids were behind me, huddled together in excitement. Marjorie stood beside them, foreboding as a schoolteacher. They all watched me. Breathe, aim, and throw. Use your head. One dart, one chance, she said. Good luck. What are the rules? I asked. Breathe, aim, and throw. Use your head. One dart, one chance, she said again. I looked at the kids. They nodded in agreement. You gotta hit the right balloon, one of the girls said. You don't know which is right, though. We all got it wrong. I turned back to the game. There were ten balloons sprawled across the board, all ranging in color. None of the colors repeated, and the sizes ranged from balloon to balloon. I picked the dart up off the table and aimed it at the board. I pointed the metal tip at each balloon. I was waiting for some kind of indicator, a change of the wind, a flash of light, a tremble through the ground. But as I made it from balloon to balloon, nothing changed. They all seemed to be the same. I turned back to Marjorie. Can I get a hint? I asked. Marjorie took a step toward me. She sighed in frustration. I could smell her breath. It was rotten, but covered up with something sweet. It reminded me of the kettle corn. You have such a strong feeling on right and wrong, Marjorie said. So, which of these balloons is wrong? I look back at them. They all look like normal balloons. Nothing distinguished one from the next. I don't know. Your time is running out. What? Breathe, aim, and throw. Use your head, she said. I lifted the dart and aimed it at the wall. I could just throw it. It wouldn't be past Marjorie to ruin my life based on chance. But I knew there was more to her than that. This was a game, after all. What fun would her torture be if, when it was over, she couldn't rub the answer in my face? I'm bored. You're bored. 30 seconds. That's not fair. Marjorie lifted the invisible mouse and dropped it into her mouth. She laughed as she chewed on the air. 25 seconds now. I look back at the board. What did she say? What clues did I have? Breathe, aim, and throw. Use your head. One dart, one chance. Breathe, aim, and throw. Use your head. One dart, one chance. What did she mean by breathe? I let out a long exhale. Marjorie laughed. The balloon stayed the same. You're missing the point. What? Marjorie kept laughing. 20 seconds. I was missing the point. How was I missing the point? What was the point of her little game? To show me how weak I was? To have fun at my demise? What was the point? No matter how much I tried, I'd always be weaker than her, or was there another point? Was there a... Was there a... A point? I looked down at the dart. On the center of the metal point, there was a hole. It was the tiniest hole I'd ever seen. But it was a hole. Maybe a thread could go through. But even that was a stretch. I thought through the rest of the riddle. Breathe, aim, and throw... Use your head, one dart, one chance. Breathe, 
15 seconds. I brought the dart to my lips. As I breathed into the hole, nothing happened at first. But then I noticed something. The balloons on the board got bigger. I kept blowing, and they got bigger. But the bigger they got, the more they changed. The colors took on more colors, then lines, then shades, then faces. They were indistinguishable at first, but slowly the features took shape. Mouths and eyes stretched to life, looking at me with grimaces of pain, like their bones were squished to the balloon's size. Ten seconds. I kept breathing into the dart as the kids behind me cheered. I looked back at Marjorie. She didn't give anything away. Her smile was perfectly still. When I couldn't blow into the dart any longer, I looked at the faces. They were recognizable now. A shiver ran down my spine. My mom's face was in the top left corner. Her mouth twisted into a look of horror. Her eyes never settled on me, but focused behind me on the other kids. Her gaze was lifeless. I looked at the other faces. Dad was there too, looking half dead. He was chewing on his lip with the lazy focus of a cow. Preston was there too, as was Marjorie, and the hippie parents, and the boy, and the video store man. Their faces continued to change. The stairs became more alive, like animals waking in time for slaughter. I lifted the dart and aimed at each one. You'll never save yourself. Marjorie barked, her voice is two octaves lower than normal. You're weak. You've always been weak. Weak, little girl. I moved the dart across each face. Each one yelled something new at me. Coward. Freak. Loser. You should have went through with it. Everyone hates you. Hurry up! One of the kids yelled. Seven. Marjorie said. I studied the balloons, my palms now sweating. None of these looked more wrong than the others. They were all bad in their own way, so which one of these was the wrong balloon? It didn't make sense. I thought back to Marjorie's hints. Breathe, aim, and throw. Use your head. One dart, one chance. Breathe, check, aim, and throw. I couldn't yet, not until I knew where to throw it. As the balloon heads kept taunting me, Marjorie continued to count. Six. Use your head. One dart. One chance. Use your head. Use your head? I lifted my hand to my face. As I made contact, I jumped. My face didn't feel right. I touched it again. My skin was sticky. When I ran my finger down my cheek, it made a squeak sound. I recognized the texture, but I couldn't quite name it. It wasn't quite kettle corn sticky, but it was close. Use your head. Use your head. I kept touching my face. Five. Just throw the dart, a girl yelled. I aimed the dart at the balloons. I didn't have time to think or use my head or whatever that meant. I just had to throw. Unless Marjorie meant to. I touched my face again. I realized what the texture was. Four. I flicked the side of my face and heard a hollow pop. My head flung to the side and then bounced right back. I did it again, just as before. My head flew down into my shoulder and then popped up. Use my head. My head was a balloon. But that meant I would have to. Three. I looked down at the dart's point. The metal glistened in the dull carnival light. I knew this was going to hurt. Really hurt. Maybe hurt more than anything I'd ever felt before. But what was my alternative? Be stuck with Marjorie in the other place forever? I imagined that forever. I smelled its stench, saw its endless light, felt its endless dark. I pictured my skin taut and preserved like a pickle in a jar, the glass gathering dust. I saw mom's pain, her doubled over body, my funeral filled with pictures and flowers. Preston was there, slapping himself in the face, his guilt too heavy to handle. Two. Marjorie would be there too, smiling that same stupid smile. It made me angry, really angry. But my anger only made Marjorie more powerful. I was the mouse, kicking through the sky, desperate to feel the ground again. Then if I ever did land, I'd have to look up at her bloody fangs and wait for my fate. 
All the while, I'd be feeding her. She'd get stronger as I got weaker. She'd feel free and grand and filled with light. I touched my rubber skin one last time. One. I grabbed the dart with both of my hands. As I held it out in front of me, I gathered all of my strength. Then, in one single motion, I dropped my head and tensed my arms, and just as the point touched between my eyes, I heard it. Then everything went dark. When I opened my eyes, everything was still dark. People were screaming, calling out for help. But in the distance, I heard other sounds, joyful sounds. Kids cheered, carnival music played, roller coasters flew down tracks. Hello? I said. Hello? Someone responded. Then more voices. Hello? Who's there? What's going on? Hello? Their voices sounded familiar. As they called for help, our space warmed up. Within a few minutes, it got hot, then really hot. It was like breathing bath water. Sweat poured down my face. Hello? Hello? Someone started banging on something. It sounded like pots and pans. I reached out to find it. My hands hit a wall. I pounded it with my fists. What's going on? Hello? Help! Hello? We screamed louder as we punched the metal wall. It was hard to breathe. We didn't have much time. Then I heard it. A new voice. Stay calm, it said. It was coming from behind the wall. All of a sudden, light blasted in. It hurt my eyes, but slowly I made sense of the white light. People were coming in to grab us. I looked around. I knew where I recognized the voices from. The five kids from the carnival were trapped with me. They looked just as they had in the other place. As people came in and grabbed them, I waited for someone to lift me up too. But no one did. As soon as people recognized who the five kids were, screams and cheers erupted through the crowd. The children were pushed and pulled into people's arms. Grown men and women broke down into babies, their tired faces erupting with pain and joy and shock. As the crowd huddled around the missing children, I stepped out and made sense of my surroundings. We'd been trapped in the center of the carousel. We were right behind the painting. Where? 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 One woman cried as she grabbed one of the girls. <laughs> You're just as you were. It's been... How did... After three years, you... Oh, my... <laughs> a man cried, grabbing his son. I pushed through the crowd, looking for Preston, or Mom, or anyone to rejoice at my return. But no one was there. No one acknowledged me. Preston? I said, pushing through people. Hello? Then, amongst the cheers, a panicked voice. Someone help her! They cried. A woman moved toward me then ran right by. She went over to the side carousel. As a crowd gathered beside the ride, I pushed through to see what they saw. Hidden beside the ride, twisted in the spare gates, there was a girl. Her body was bent in an inhuman shape, like an overcooked pretzel. For a moment, I didn't recognize her, but then I did. How? My eyes were half open staring lifelessly into the sky. Blood clouded my teeth, a line of it falling down my chin. I, or she, or we, did not look right. We looked. Emma? Someone yelled. I looked over. It was Preston. He tried to push through the crowd, but it was too dense. People were caught between cries of joy and horror the back of the crowd oblivious to what the front just discovered. Call an ambulance! Someone yelled. Move away, give her air. I stepped away from the commotion. I was here, but there, but also here. Preston jumped onto the platform. He was standing right next to me. Preston? I said. He didn't acknowledge me. Instead, he stared down at the dead girl. He started to cry. I turned to look at Marjorie. She didn't move from her ticket-taker post. Her chest raised like a royal guard. She looked back at me and... 
For a split second, she met my stare. She saw me. I dropped to my knees. My head felt like a snare drum. I dropped my face into my hands and tried to catch my breath. It was all happening too fast. When I looked up again, I noticed something strange. The painting was right above me, but it had changed. The five children were gone. In their place, there was only one. Her arms crossed and gazed fixed out into the world. Her mouth stretched down like a clown's. Tortured and sad, she was still trapped. She was me. As each day passed, the sun set sooner. Night was always the worst time for me. The nurses would turn off the lights and clear the room. Then, for nine long hours, I would stand at the edge of my hospital bed and watch myself. My body looked like a failed science experiment. My hair growing through my buzz cut, my face sprawled with acne. When it was daytime, I could distract myself looking out at the changing trees, their greens turning to browns and reds, where I could watch the fall sky roll in, its summer blue dulling to gray. The school across from the hospital bustled with excited kids. In the daylight, the world was a happy place. But at night, everything felt terribly still. All the while, I laid in my bed, not quite alive, not quite dead, just... There. The longer I laid, the more tense my face got. When I was first wheeled in after the carnival, my face was soft, almost angelic. But now, I'd been hardened, like food left on the counter. My body was fighting to stay alive, but the fight was a losing one. Each day, I moved closer to death. The other me was fine, though. I didn't feel pain. My steps were feather light. I never got hungry. Overall, I felt unusually bright, like a light left on in an abandoned house. When the days turned to weeks, I thought about leaving my side and going into town. I was bored, clinically bored, but I was nervous. What if leaving meant I could never come back? What if leaving meant death? So instead, I studied the lines on my EKG machine. I eavesdropped on nurse conversations. I watched whatever they left on the TV. I passed the time. And there was a lot of time. I had a few visitors in the beginning. Preston came for the first few weeks. He would sit in the corner and read or tell me stories or apologize for letting me fall. All the while, I watched him watch me his eyes welling if he looked at my body for too long. I didn't want him to blame himself, but if I was being honest, I enjoyed Guilty Preston. He wasn't so painfully cool. He was himself, a sad, weird dude. And more than anything, I enjoyed his company. It wasn't like my mom was offering any. She hung outside the door, watching but never entering. I don't know why I expected anything different. So, for most of my coma, I was alone. All I had was my own company. Then, on a brisk October morning, my fortune started to change. The sun was high in the sky, erasing shadows throughout the town. I was looking out the window, admiring the way the light cut through the fall colors. Then, behind me, I heard chatter. I turned around. Mom hugged someone outside my room. I couldn't tell who it was. When the door swung open, I recognized the visitor instantly. I wanted to leap back into my body and hide. She had her same smile. The edges of it curled up, her teeth small and gray. She looked at my body in the bed and sighed. Then quickly, she glanced at me. The real me. We locked eyes. Then she looked away. She saw me. Of course she saw me. She put me here. As she sat down next to my body, I kept my eyes on her. She was wearing a tape head video polo, 
in torn blue jeans, the cuffs frayed right above her flip-flops. I couldn't believe something so demonic was wearing flip-flops. I know you see me, I said. Speaking to someone felt strange. When you spend weeks replaying the same conversations in your head, speaking out loud feels like an invasion of privacy. Hello, dear, Marjorie said, still looking at my body. How are you feeling? She spoke calm and clear. I wanted to kick her head into the wall. I solved your riddle, I said, when we were at the carnival. Did you forget? I'm supposed to be free. Marjorie held her hands in prayer. She sighed, her breath high-pitched like a kettle. When I asked about what you saw your first night here, I wasn't trying to get you into trouble, she said. I hope you know that. Outside, the weather mimicked my anger. Raindrops flicked the glass. Is that all you want? I asked, stepping toward her. Yes, I saw your dog die. I saw it get thrown out the window. Do I know how or why that happened? No, I can't even begin to understand this- This place, Marjorie asked. I think you understand this place pretty well. No, I don't. Enlighten me. You've been to this place before. What? I get a lot of applications for my properties, you know? Ever since Twin Pines got rated sleepiest town in America. I get a dozen applications a day. It's a beautiful house. And the price is right. Marjorie kept her eyes on my body. She unlatched her prayer hands and grabbed mine. They sat lifeless in hers. Don't touch me! I needed someone who understood this place. Someone who's tasted it, felt it, was drawn to it. You've been drawn to this place for a long time. What are you talking about? Hospital records are easy to find, dear. If you call and get the right numbskull, they'll spill everything. Hello. This is Martha Bates, the nurse from Twin Pines High School. I need to confirm the medical records from a Miss Emma Flowers. Marjorie turned to face me. The real me. You know about my attempt? I asked. Why do you say it like that? Attempt. Attempt. Oh, poor me. I tried to kill myself. Don't be so hard on yourself. You were drawn to my world, Emma dear. You understand that the place you were born has nothing left to offer you. I shook my head. No, I was sick. I wasn't thinking straight. Cats get to live in the big, beautiful house while mice are forced into the walls. Don't you want to live in the house? I kept shaking my head. And maybe one day, you'll turn into a cat yourself, she said. Wouldn't that be nice? This town could be a two-cat household. Marjorie stood up and walked toward me. I looked to the door. Mom was chatting with the nurses. She was smiling. Of course she was. The one moment I needed her to save me. The moment I needed her to see how much of a fraud Marjorie was. She's not here. She's never been here. She won't even step inside my hospital room. She didn't then, and she won't now. She just hangs in the hallway like a nosy neighbor, listening to the beeps of my slow death. I know you're scared. I know it's hard to acquaint yourself with my side of the universe. But it'll be okay if you come with me. I'll give a life, a real life. A life where people listen to you, love you, give you power. No, I don't. No. As Marjorie moved closer, I moved away. But I was running out of space. It wouldn't be long before she overtook me. Those children from the carnival weren't ready for this world. I tried to show them, but they didn't listen. They were caught in the illusion of your world. They missed their parents. Can you imagine? Missing strangers like that. I couldn't understand it. 
Marjorie reached out and touched my shoulder. But you, Emma, you understand me. I know we bicker, but there's a part of you that understands this place. I can feel it. I pushed her hand away. I'm not your mouse. You can't keep pulling me in and out. I just want to go home. Is that so? Yes. You want to go home. Yes. And where would that place be? I paused. I opened my mouth to speak, but retracted. I knew the answer. It was an easy question. All I had to do was say it. But every time I tried, I felt a mass in my throat. Outside, the storm was picking up. Lightning struck in the distance. Marjorie stepped closer. I tried to move back, but I hit the wall. Her face was inches from mine. You've never been home, dear. There's no place for you in this world. I can hear your thoughts, Emma. I know how you feel. Stop hiding. I know you dream of being yourself. And here you can be so much more than you've ever dreamed of. You can be the real Emma Flowers. No! I looked away from her. Her breath was hot and minty. A tear streamed down my cheek. She wiped it away with her thumb. Don't touch me! I said. You don't have a lot of time, she said. I kept shaking my head. I had a home. I had a bed and a roof and a drawer full of clothes. I had a home. I had a home. I... Give in, Marjorie whispered. There was something about her voice, like it was the warmest blanket ever created. For a moment, I felt so drawn to her, but I knew she was a liar. I needed to get home, to my mom, to my life, to... I needed to get home. Didn't I? I don't want to be your mouse, I said, my voice quiet. What do you want to be then? She asked. I... I closed my eyes. I didn't know. I picked you, Emma. Who else can say that? Your mom can't. Your dad can't. No. They just happened upon you like some wounded animal. But me? I selected you. There were hundreds of children. Thousands, even. But you... You're special. You were not built for their world. You were built for mine. The rain fell harder, louder. I can barely hear my thoughts. I just want to be alive, I said. I knew that sentence well. I'd spoken it so much it was muscle memory. Is that so? She asked. Yeah. I couldn't look at her. You can be honest with me, Marjorie said. I peeled off the wall and walked back toward my hospital bed. Marjorie followed, gliding over the floor, her speed matching mine. I turned away from her and faced my body. It was difficult to look at myself. I was beginning to rot. I didn't want to admit it, but it was the truth. I saw it in the yellow of my skin, in the way I smelled. Time was running out. Do you remember Lisa? She asked. I looked up at her. Yeah, I said. What do you think of her? She asked. What do you mean? How did you feel when you saw what she could do? The beeps on my EKG were spacing apart. My body twitched. Please, I just want to live. Answer my question, she said. I thought back on that night. I remember leaning over Lisa's small frame, caught between her size and her presence. I envied that kind of strength. I, I thought she was cool. I, I don't know, I said. Why? Anger dislodged in my gut. It was the anger I'd been sitting on, the one that had grown and grown over the last two months. She kicked the shit out of your stupid dog, I said. Actually, no. She killed your stupid, stupid dog. And your dog was a bully. So yeah, I liked Lisa. I wish Lisa would come in and do the same thing to... 
The room grew dark, clouds covered the sky. In the hallway, the overhead lights flickered off one by one. Marjorie stepped back, extending her arms above her head, then slowly her legs shrank. She looked at me as her face contorted, her features blending like melted plastic, her cheekbones sharpened, her nose lengthened. The hair above her lip, once faint, started to grow. It extended across her cheek, long and skinny like whiskers. As she dropped to her knees, her back arched. Her polo and jeans slid off, too big for her new body. Inch by inch, her pale skin sprouted fields of black fur. Marjorie was gone. Lisa looked up at me. You admired her power, did you? Lisa said, her voice shrill. It was hard to speak. How you were... Or... Lisa said. Lisa extended her legs and again transformed. Her fur grew thicker, her nose turned to a snout. The room filled with a loud crunch of bones. In a moment, Lisa was gone. The new thing's head tilted to the side, its neck clearly broken. Maybe you connected more with Beelzy, the thing said. I recognized it now. It was her dog. I watched you stand over my body. I saw how you looked at him. A poor little helpless baby. Just like you. The dog snapped its head to the side, re-breaking its neck. Or maybe it was his brother, little bub. Maybe you felt like the one left behind. Outside, lightning attacked the air. The rain was deafening. Black clouds swallowed the trees. Or was it the awkward video store owner you connected with? The dog's back legs straightened as it stood upright. As the bones snapped and reformed, fur shed onto Marjorie's clothes. Slowly, the long, twisted body of the video store owner appeared. He was naked, his joints protruding against his skin. He looked more skeleton than man, more concept than creation. He towered over me, his veins pulsing, neon yellow blood. There are many doors that lead to my house, sweet Emma, she said, her voice coming out of his mouth. I looked up at him. He must have been eight feet tall. They were all... The man morphed back down to Marjorie. She was naked now, too, her skin heavy and wrinkled. A poorly made costume. I could see her skull through her eye sockets. Come over to my side, she said. I looked back at my body. It was stirring. The EKG was beeping in a strange rhythm, stopping for a few seconds, then beeping quickly. Please, I said. Just, just put me back. You won't be alone for long. Please, no! I pressed my hands in prayer. Next, we'll bring Preston. No! Then your mom. The machine stopped beeping. My body was twitching. What's happening? Then, mouse by mouse, we'll bring the whole town over. Then we'll move to the next town, then the next state, then the next country. Mouse by mouse, we'll build our dark kingdom. Won't that be wonderful? The machine beeped again. It had been ten seconds since my last heartbeat. I looked at the door. Mom was talking to a nurse, pointing up at the turned-off lights. They were laughing. How come no one was checking on me? They were supposed to be a part of my world, on my side. How could they be so selfish? Are they just going to let me die? Marjorie reached out her hand. Take my hand and you can stay with me forever. If not, I can't help you. If I don't go there, then where? Where will you go? She said. I nodded. Marjorie, or whatever she was, leaned close. Between the transformation, she'd lost her form. Her disguise too large for the old woman's skeleton. Even worse than her mismatched body was her smell. It was raw and fermented, the smell of organs spilling out of skin, a trash can filled with animal guts. 
it's a forgotten place. Vast as the ocean and dark as the moon. Please let me stay here. In my real life. Please. I looked at the nurses. I wanted to grab their smiles and pull until their faces peeled off. Why wouldn't they save me? You don't want to end up in that place. Take my hand. I know what you want. Her face was right in front of mine. Her mouth drooped like a rag doll's. My heart monitor stopped again. Foam filled my body's mouth. You don't know what I want! I said. Yes, I do. Because it's the same thing. I want. What's that? I asked. Marjorie paused for a moment. The next hailed. Air whistled through her teeth. Spit landed on my cheek. <sighs> to be seen. All of a sudden, the rain stopped. The lights came on, bright and nauseating. Marjorie reached her hand out to me. Last chance, she said. A new quiet took over the room. I looked over at my body. I wasn't twitching anymore. The lines on the EKG were flat. What's happening? I asked. Three. I... I am not ready. I... Two. Red foam fell off my lips in bubbly lines. My eyes were open, staring at the ceiling. The EKG made a loud, monotone noise. I... I... Please! Marjorie shook her head. I thought you'd be one of the smart ones, she said. Oh well. Goodbye, sweet Emma. No, wait! I reached out to grab her hand, but it was too late. Marjorie stepped away as her skin recoiled. The old Marjorie was back. She reached down and grabbed her clothes. As she slipped them on, she stood at the side of my bed and screamed. Doctors! Please! I think she's... Oh no! The nurses ran in, a doctor following behind. They pushed Marjorie to the side and hovered over me. Mom pressed her face against the glass, watching me. She didn't ask questions, or cry, or scream. She just looked at me, her face calm as settled snow. As the nurses prodded me with machines, Marjorie sat in the corner, her head in her hands. After a moment, she looked up at me. I matched her glare. A small smirk grazed her lips before frowning again. I felt frozen. My strength was slipping. The EKG stopped making noise. The nurses straightened up and moved away from my body. They looked at one another, sweat dripping down their foreheads. Time of death, 1.12 p.m., one of them said. The rest of them nodded, then started putting things away. Is she gone? My mom asked through the window. No one answered. The doctor walked toward her. I followed him. When the door swung closed on me, I passed right through it. Mom was sitting on a chair outside the hospital room. Sweat ran down her forehead and onto her cheek, mimicking a tear. She looked up at the doctor. He reached down to hold her hand. We did everything we could, he said. How long does she have? She said. I'm sorry? She's been dead before. She had an accident a few months ago. Her heart stopped. The doctor said if she stayed dead much longer, she'd have permanent brain damage. How long before it's at that point? The doctor nodded, still squeezing her hand. The brain can survive without oxygen for about five minutes. Then talk to me in four minutes, Mom said. If my daughter is still gone, I will mourn. God hasn't taken her yet. And with that, Mom bowed her head and prayed. I looked at her hands. They were incredibly still. Well, I'll wait here if you have any other questions, the doctor said and sat next to her. Can you hear me? I asked. Mom kept her head down. I nodded, taking in a long, slow breath. I'm dead, Mom. And I'm angry. You never... You... I closed my eyes. My energy was fleeting. Smoke ascending to the clouds. I was getting weaker by the second. But I didn't want to leave without saying goodbye. Or, I guess, good riddance. 
You never cared about me, did you? You never wanted a daughter, especially after Dad left. I was a chore, a pain, a thing to feed, and bathe, and look after. When I tried to kill myself, it wasn't because I was so miserable. No, it's because the life I had wasn't mine. It was yours. I was your shadow, and I was never allowed to feel what you weren't feeling. I leaned down to get in her face. She was whispering the Our Father. You should have let me die then. Because now, none of it is my choice. Killing myself was one thing I decided for myself. And now, someone's taken my own death from me. Are you happy? Is this what you wanted? Mom kept her eyes on the ground. Maybe if you cared, even one percent, maybe I'd be alive. But, I... <sighs> Bye, Mom. I turned around and walked away. I didn't want to see her once I finally died. When my four minutes was up, I didn't want to watch her cry or scream or do whatever show she wanted to put on. Our relationship was over. As I walked out of the hospital, I looked up at the clock tower. I'd already wasted one minute of my final four. It was 1.13 p.m. By 1.16, I'd be truly dead. I left the hospital and walked down Twin Pines Main Street. Brown leaves blew across the sidewalks. Store owners swept them away as rodents ran through the piles. Water trickled down from the gutters as birds drank from puddles. Cars rolled through traffic lights. The sun hid behind the clouds. The living lived as their atom clouds waved to one another, their blood pulsing aimlessly. I was a stranger to their world now. When I made it to the end of Main Street, I looked back at the clock tower. Another minute passed by. 1.14 p.m. Two to go. When I turned the corner, I saw a familiar face. He was smoking a cigarette outside a quaint row home. It's outside decorated with an American flag and a giant, inflatable pumpkin. I'd never been to Preston's house, but it made sense. It was small and strange, cool in an old-fashioned kind of way. I walked up and looked at him. Hey, I said. He looked up for a moment, his eyes wide. Then he shook his head. I tried again. Hey, I'm dead, I said. It's kind of weird, but not too bad, I guess. It's kind of like being alive, but I don't have to pretend that people can't see me. Preston stomped out his cigarette and opened the door. I followed him inside. His mom was sitting at the kitchen table reading a book called Teenage Depression and Drugs. She has Preston's face, mousy and serious, her ears poking out of her hair the same way Preston's did. She looked up and smiled. Enjoy your tobacco lunch, she said. Very much, he said, then smiled. She laughed. <laughs> Is your friend coming over later? I haven't heard from her. The video store closes at 10, though, so maybe after that... His mom laid down her book. Let me know if you want me to talk to her, she said. I don't want you to be overwhelmed. I want to help. I don't mind. In the kitchen, the oven timer went off. Preston's mom went over and pulled out a chicken. Steam filled the windows. I tried to smell it, but nothing came through. I'm going to go upstairs. I'll be down later, he said. Preston's mom nodded, then went about cutting the massive bird. I followed Preston upstairs to his bedroom. When we walked inside, I was shocked by the level of mess he had. His ceiling fan was detached and laying in the corner. There was thousands of pieces of paper, some in binders, some in folders, others just sprawled across the carpet. There was a small section of free space on his bed. He sat on it and looked up where the ceiling fan used to be. I watched him watch the empty space, his eyes welling. He worked to catch his breath, but it looked difficult, like each one was getting further away. After a moment, a tear rolled down his cheek. If you miss your ceiling fan so much, you should hire someone to reinstall it, I said. His sadness turned to terror, his back straightening, eyes growing wide. Hello? He said. My heart, or what used to be my heart, jumped. Can you hear me? Hello? Y yes, I... Who is that? Preston was looking just over my shoulder. It's Emma, 
Can, can you hear me? Emma? Oh my god, yes. I... How... Where are you? He laughed as he wiped back a tear. I, I missed you. He said. I tried to ignore how the words felt. It was like someone squeezed the air out of my lungs. <laughs> Your room is a mess. I've been busy. I looked over at his clock. It was 1.15 p.m. Another minute gone. One minute left. Preston, I need you to listen carefully. I'm dead. Dead as a doorknob. I wanted to say goodbye. I really liked being your friend. I pushed away the feeling again. It reminded me of the birds in my stomach feeling. The flapping, the squawking, the flying into the walls. I shook my head. I wasn't going to spend my last minute sad. Preston looked up where his ceiling fan used to be. He looked confused for a moment, then sighed. Oh. I... I'm sorry. Don't be. He chewed his fingertips, his eyes bouncing from object to object. His lips were incredibly chapped, like he hadn't drank water in days. Don't be sad. Dead is dead, you know? You don't want me to be sad that you're dead? He shook his head. Of course I'm gonna be... He paused and took a long breath. It looked like he was going to cry. Stop it. That's so lame. Stop. He started to cry. There he was, sitting on the edge of his bed, his face buried in his hands, his voice heavy and wailing, first breathing, then panting, then gasping. I hated it. I hated the sound, the look, the feeling. I hated him so much then. Suck it up. You're going to live your whole life like this? Sad? Depressed? Because once you start, you can't take it back, you know? Once you go down this hole, it's just going to get deeper and deeper, and one day, you're going to look up and realize there's no escape, okay? I, I know about these things. So, just stop it, okay? Just... Preston threw his head back and laughed. Tears streamed down his face, but he was smiling. God, for someone who hates their mother, you sound just like her. I shook my head. Excuse me? Preston stood up and went to the papers on his desk. He grabbed one and looked at it. I've learned more about head injuries these last three months than I ever thought possible. What are you talking about? Your mom's been coming over here. I know that sounds weird, but it's true. It started once a week, then twice. Now it's up to almost every night. At first, she was grilling me about what happened at the carnival. Then she started bringing in these articles, asking if I'd help her read through them. So, yeah, that's what I've been up to. Again, Preston looked at the empty space on his ceiling. My mom went through a similar thing after, you know. She started buying all these books and reading things and I don't know. I get how your mom is feeling. Preston dropped the paper onto the carpet and picked up another one. There were hundreds of documents, journal articles, pictures, transcript conversations with the doctors, Bible verses. There were books, VHS tapes, a toy carousel covered in post-it notes. At the edge of Preston's desk was a paper that especially caught my eye. It was a list of dates and times next to a repeated phone number. At the top of the page was a handwritten note. The father. There were over 50 attempted phone calls. From the looks of it, they were all outgoing. They lasted the same amount of time, 21 seconds at the bottom. Mom wrote another note, same as always. But it's not like she cares. She's a bad mother, that's a fact. Preston shrugged, kicking aside a pile of clothes. There was a TV underneath them. I don't see it that way, but I get it. Parents are tough. They can be a never-ending riddle. I felt strange. A sensation, warm and heavy, crawled up my torso and landed on my face. My vision grew blurry. I felt terribly tired. I looked down at my hand. The difference was subtle, but it was there, ever so slightly. I could see through it. Preston leaned down and grabbed the TV. I told her about our video store experience, about the happy corner. The next day, she brought it over. She had this whole theory about how electromagnetic signals caused your coma. She wouldn't let me turn it on, not until she brought a real doctor in to look at it. So, it's just been gathering dust. Preston ran his finger along the top. A small cloud of dust kicked up. I'm glad I have it, though. 
I don't want to watch those movies again, but it's a good memory. Remember how real those videos felt? Like the scariest movie I'd ever seen. Do you remember? My strange feeling wasn't going away. I looked at my hand again. I was disappearing. I looked at the clock. I had ten seconds left. This is it. What's it? What's happening? The physical feeling was met with another feeling. A rush of hot air. My thoughts were tripping over one another, ideas collapsing, multiplying, splitting. I thought of everything and nothing in a single thought, a multitude of color and sound of pain and joy, of being and disappearing. I'm scared. Preston started looking around, snapping his fingers. Uh, uh, what do we do? He asked. I want to go home, I said. Seven seconds. My arm was gone. Help me, I said. He looked around, frantic. I don't understand this place. What place? He asked. Five seconds. This place, Marjorie's place, the video store place, the... I don't know what this is. Four seconds. They're all the same place. I yelled, but my voice felt far away. The video store? What do you mean? They're all the same. My neighbor, the owner, the dogs, Lisa. They're the same. There's something here in town. I don't know what it is, but it has me. Preston jumped behind the TV. He fumbled with the cord. Three seconds. What are you doing? I asked. It was hard to stand. Everything was spinning. Preston ran the plug of the TV over to the wall. He kicked aside the stack of medical books and found the outlet. He tried to plug it in, but he kept dropping it. Two seconds. What are you? My voice moved further away. A train leaving the station. I tried to sit down, but when I looked down, there was no body left to sit. My chest was a scattering of dots. What do you see? He said, pointing at the screen. When the TV flashed on, I recognized the place right away. It was staticky and dull. The colors washed out, but I knew the place. I'd been standing there for the last two months. It was my hospital room. I thought back to something Marjorie said in the midst of her shape-shifting. There are many doors to my house. Sweet Emma. The door back had been here all along. One second remained. I tried to jump into the screen, but I had no legs to jump. I sank down to the floor. My vision blurred, sounds muddled. Earth ate sun, clouds swallowed light. I was one second too late, but in my final glimpse of life, I saw something. The body on the hospital bed opened its eyes. Emma Flowers, the twice dead loser, looked at me through our fading portal. She lifted herself up and extended her hand. I tried to reach back, but I was too weak. Yet somehow she kept reaching the light half extending into the dark, the reel grabbing the shadow. Just as the clock struck zero, Emma's arm reached through the screen, cloaked in a bright white light. She grabbed what was left of me and pulled. The ground was replaced by thousands of stars, hissing as they collided. Black and white dots filled the sky. Then the black dots disappeared. Everything turned white, blinding, blistering white. When you try to open your eyes, you notice a strange weight on your face. You hadn't felt this kind of weight in months. The heavy, sweaty feeling of skin, of body, of being. Sounds still feel far away, like you're listening through a tunnel. Drops of light make their way in. There are faces surrounding yours. Some are smiling, some are wide-eyed. You've been here before, but now it all feels new. For the first time in a long time, you understand what it means to feel awake. You try to speak, but you can't. It feels like someone stuffed coffee grounds in your throat. The doctor puts his hand on your shoulder. Easy. He says. You close your eyes. Then you sink back into another place. Not the other place. This place is your own. Warm. And filled with dreams. I woke up two days later. Mom was sitting at the edge of my hospital bed. 
her hands held in prayer. When she saw me, she smiled the biggest smile I'd ever seen on her. Her teeth were small and white, her eyes a Caribbean kind of blue. I never realized how pretty she was. God chose you, she said, then grabbed my ankle. I nodded. Instead of talking, we shared the silence, our stares meeting. As I looked at her, I thought about the papers. There must have been thousands of them. For every unspoken thought, Mom had a hundred sheets of paper. After a few minutes of quiet, I mustered the strength for one question. Did he ever call you back? I asked. She looked up, her head tilted to the side. Your father, she asked. I nodded, and Mom sighed. How'd you know I called him? Preston told me during one of his visits. I lied. I guess my brain was listening. Mom nodded. She squeezed my ankle. Maybe I had the wrong number, she said. I don't want you hating your father, if that's what you're getting at. Life can be complicated. With that, Mom stood up. She brushed imagined dust off her blouse. I know this feels like I'm running away, she said, but I need to head to a shift. Hospitals are expensive. It's okay. I'm okay. Mom caught herself in the window. When she saw herself, she looked angry, like she and her reflection were in the middle of an argument. It's just the hospital rooms make me upset, she said. If your brain didn't hear me visit you, it's because I... Uh, uh, well, I, I didn't. I was outside. Right there. She pointed to the door. But not in here. I hope you don't think I'm a bad mother. It's just... I don't know. God makes such beautiful creatures, but this is an ugly place. I know. It's okay. I'm okay. Everything is okay now. Mom nodded, her expression stern. Maybe one day our lives will be better than okay, Mom said. But for now, I think okay is pretty good. With that, Mom picked up her purse and walked out the door. On my first day home, Preston came to visit. Mom wheeled me up to the front door, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw him walking towards us. He waved, his smile big and goofy. When he walked up, he picked weeds off our lawn and bunched them into a bouquet. It was a very Preston gift. Hi, Preston, dear, Mom said, walking inside. I'll leave you two alone. I managed to stand from the wheelchair and hug him. He dropped the bouquet on my chair and hugged me back. It was a little awkward at first. I don't think we'd ever made contact before. He smelled like dish soap. Do you remember? He asked. I hugged him a little tighter. I remember, I said. Thanks for saving me. It was a lucky guess, he said. When he pulled away, he kept his eyes on the ground, his cheeks blushing. Outside, the air was cold and crisp. I pulled my flannel sleeves up to cover my hands. For a moment, we stood in our silence, the fall breeze whipping through the neighborhood. Kids chased each other across the lawns. Birds flew in formation across the sky. The world moved towards winter, as it always did. But when I looked at Preston, I noticed something strange. He looked stuck. I'm not good with, um being like emotional or whatever, but your mom told me something about you and I don't know, I can't stop thinking about it. He said. I nodded. I knew what he was talking about. At first I was embarrassed, but quickly that feeling went away. In a strange way, I was excited. Mom never told anyone about my suicide attempt. Maybe my big secret didn't have to be so big anymore. It was stupid, I said. Being alive is pretty sweet. Yeah, I know. He said. Preston kept his eyes on the ground. The muscles in his neck were protruding, like he was holding his breath. Are you okay? I asked. I wasn't able to, like, read people's minds or whatever until after I, I went through my own, you know? Like, when I was there, in that place, you know? That place... Like, maybe it's some sort of, I don't know, waiting room? 
like a waiting room to hell or something. I don't know. It's, it's like weird, you know? I shook my head. I'm sorry, but I, I have no idea what you're saying, I said. Are you high? I mean, I did notice that book your mom was reading. Are you a secret druggie or something? I laughed, but Preston didn't. The fan. He said softly. What about the... The pieces came together. The fan ripped off the ceiling. His mom's book on teenage depression. The way he was talking. Oh, I said. There was a long silence. You had an attempt? I asked. About a year ago. It was stupid. I was just like... I don't know. I woke up one day and everything felt dumb. Like, why was I doing this shit? Why go to school? It all ends the same, you know? We're on this big conveyor belt towards dust. So, like, I, I might as well take the highway there. I laughed. I know it wasn't funny. But it was the way he said it. Preston talked about suicide like he was trying to sell it to me. Like it was a refrigerator. I covered my mouth, but Preston was laughing too. <laughs> I'm sorry. You make it sound so... efficient. <laughs> I know. That's wrong. No. It's really not wrong. That's why it's so hard. Preston nodded, his face growing serious again. He rubbed his hands together. I set everything up and tied the rope, and when I jumped, I guess I didn't jump hard enough. So, like, my neck didn't break, you know? I was just suffocating up there. He blushed. I'm sorry. I know that's TMI. I reached out and grabbed his hand. It's okay, I said. He held my hand with both of his. I lost consciousness, and when I opened my eyes, I was in this cornfield, and the sun was rising. In the distance, there was this group of kids playing Duck Duck Goose or something. A chill walked down my back. How many kids? I asked. He let go of my hand and took a step back. He paced in a small circle. Four or five, I don't remember. They came up to me and said hi. They were really nice, and I was like, wow, okay, I'm dead. This is what dead feels like, you know? I was there a whole day. I felt light and happy and calm. We ate candy and played tag, but then as the sun set, it didn't go behind the earth. It just got closer and closer, and I was like, that's strange. Then all at once, it crashed into the cornfield. Everything lit on fire, and just as the wave of flames hit me, I woke up in my body. I was in the hospital. Doctors were stuffing me with tubes. Preston leaned down and grabbed a blade of grass. He ripped it into a dozen pieces. They kept me in the hospital for a few months. I had to do all this counseling stuff, you know? And then one day, I was sitting in the hospital cafeteria with another kid from my program. All of a sudden, he says, these pizza sticks are trash. And I was like, what? And then he was like, what? And then I realized he hadn't said anything. Preston laughed, shaking his head. After that, it would happen every once in a while. Someone would say something and I would respond. Then I'd realize they never said anything at all. It's like our subconscious is in the other place, you know? Like everyone has an unknown part of themselves over there. And maybe since I went there, I saw that. A part of you never left, I said. Preston nodded. Across the road, Marjorie stepped outside. When I saw her, I felt nauseous. I couldn't unsee the real Marjorie, the droopy skin, the eye sockets, the shifting height. This woman, whatever she was, wasn't real. We stared at one another for a moment. Then she smiled. As she waved, her dog ran up beside her and barked at us. Are we gonna wave back? Preston asked. I don't wave to strangers, I said. Marjorie's smile slowly fell. She sighed, then went about watering her plants. Preston and I kept watching her. I'm afraid there's a part of me there too, I said. At least we're there together. Our little half-selves are probably eating candy right now, trying to get rings on glass bottles. I hope I'm winning, I said. Preston laughed as he elbowed me in the side. Then he lifted his arms and hugged me again. We stayed like that for a long time. Our bodies wrapped together, our real worlds tangled the same way our imagined ones were. 
I still feared that other place. Its power, its hold. But at the same time, I was beginning to love this place, the one I always took for granted. It may be doomed to expire, but for right now, it was real. I never wanted to hold on to it before. But here I was, gripping a body like it was going to disappear. Real tears streaming down my face. My heart fluttering with fear and sadness and joy. The birds in my stomach climbing to my throat. And then... Are you okay? Preston asked. I hadn't cried like this in a long time, ever since I was a little kid. It was a deep, ugly sob. My whole body was shaking. I've never been better. <laughs> I cried. Then I wept until I couldn't any longer. Preston stayed for dinner before going home. For all the awkward dinners mom and I shared, this was different. We laughed, shared stories, said compliments to one another. Preston and mom talked about their research, comparing themselves to the Hardy Boys. Mom asked meaningful questions about Preston's depression. Preston asked me the same. And mom looked at me and listened. As I talked, she nodded her head, wiping back tears as they came. After Preston left, mom walked over and wrapped me in a hug. I love you, she said. I hugged her back. Yeah, I know, I said. You too. We held each other and breathed in rhythm, the same way we used to when I was a little girl. In, out, in and out. Oh, by the way, she said, pulling away. I have a gift for you. Oh, I said. What'd you get me? Mom walked over to the living room and grabbed a present. It was wrapped in gold paper. It's not from me, she said. It's from Marjorie. My stomach dropped. What? She brought it over while you were recovering. Mom handed me the box. I held my arm straight, keeping it far away. Let's talk more in the morning, she said. I like hearing about your feelings. Uh-huh, I said. I wish I could focus on her, but I couldn't. My eyes were glued to the box. As mom walked up to her room, I followed, keeping the box out in front of me. When I opened my door, I placed it in the middle of my room and sat on my bed. I stared at it for a long time. Eventually, the sun set, the chilly whispers of autumn pressing the windows. As the moon rose, my curiosity followed. It's just a box, I whispered. I knelt over it and peeled back the piece of tape. Nothing happened. I repeated this process piece by piece, side by side. Once the wrapping paper was gone, I was left with a cardboard box. I pried it open. Before I even took my gift out of the box, it started singing. I recognized the song right away. It was burned into my memory. The shrill voice, the twangy guitar, the muffled bass. I pulled my gift out of the box and placed it on the ground. It was a carousel. As the song played, the horses spun, their small ceramic frames trotting to the rhythm. I laid my head on the ground and inspected it. On the center of the toy, there was a painting, just like the real one from the real carousel. It was a sleepy town, its backdrop filled with mountains and tall trees. Half the stores were closed, people moseyed around, smiling at one another. Dogs played fetch, cats peered out from the shop windows. Then. In front of everyone, there was a figure. She was standing in the road, looking directly at me. I knew who she was. The shaved head, the blue eyes, the skinny arms and legs. She didn't look happy nor sad. Mostly, she looked tired, her eyes staring in soft surrender. I got up off the ground and looked down at the carousel for a moment. The song slowed to a stop. The moon went behind a cloud. The room grew dark, quiet. Then, I lifted my foot and stomped on the toy as hard as I could. Pieces scattered across the room. I stomped again and again and again. Shards of ceramic ground to dust. A sweat dripped down my forehead. I inspected the damage. Once I was sure every horse was crushed, I kicked the debris under my bed. 
I went to the window and looked across at her. I knew she'd be there, watching me. She was sitting on her porch, rocking back and forth. She looked up at me and smiled. When she waved this time, I waved back. This was no longer a game of cat and mouse. From now on, this was a cat fight. Hello, everyone. Woo! This one was an experience. <laughs> the author, Daniel DeLuise, approached me and said that he wanted to write something, and I was like, I kind of have this idea I've been thinking about, and I'm not a very good writer. And we talked a bit, and this story was made. It was kind of birthed from both of us having a couple of ideas, and I think a lot of inspiration from both of our childhood experiences are in there. So this all started out as I wanted a haunted house story, but I wanted the haunting to be different because the haunting isn't a ghost of a person, but the ghost of a vengeful animal. And so that's where Lisa came from and everything, the cat and that first whole part. And then after that, it kind of just kept evolving over the coming months. Every time I'd get a part, you know, it it would uh, sort of just evolve and it's become like this sort of larger overall story about this sleepy little town and Emma and Marjorie and it definitely feels like there's going to be more. I'm sure this is going to keep going. Uh, if you wanna check out any of Daniel's stuff, the writer of this story, please look in the description. I'm putting everything in there that you can find him on. Uh, his music as well, he wrote the theme song for the story, so the opening song and the outro song, those are by him. The band that Daniel's in that made this song is called Therapy Dogs, so they're also on Spotify if you'd like to listen to more of their stuff, and that will also be linked in the description. If you really liked this style of writing, usually a lot of people will say, I really like this style or this kind of writing and you want to read more. Daniel has said that he's planning on doing three books of this series, so, so if you really like this whole story, there's more than likely going to be more for you to read really soon. And if you want something to read right now, Daniel has two series up on Amazon at the moment, a series of scary stories called Five Minute Frights, and then another series called Witching Hour. Those will be linked in the description as well. Honestly, I really like the story. I think it came out really well, and despite the fact that I had to work on it over the course of like six months as it was kind of given to me, I think that it turned out to be a pretty cohesive storyline. And I just, I really liked the writing. I felt like the characters were real characters when I was reading it. Obviously in hindsight, had I been able to make the production a little better, I probably would have brought in someone else to play the mom, but with the way this production went, it just wasn't really possible for me at the time. And then, <laughs> the last part, oh man, listen to this. So I got the last part uh, a few days before I was leaving on a trip. And then, I, you might have seen a community post I made about my computer bricking itself. My computer fixed itself now, or... <sighs> I say fixed itself because it's fixed, but we don't know why. <laughs> But it's working now. So I had to finish the final part of the story after I got back from the trip, the same day it's being posted because I literally had no other choice. I couldn't work on it on the trip because I couldn't use my computer, it wasn't fixed. And then once it was fixed, it was the last day of the trip. And I was like, okay, I'll work on it on the plane. 
All right, well, we missed our plane. <laughs> so we had to sit in the airport for about 12 hours waiting on our next flight. And at that point, I was getting a little bit of sleep, so I lost the opportunity to work on it because I slept a little bit. God forbid I want some sleep. <laughs> because I'll tell you what, since I didn't take that opportunity to work on it, I had to not work on it for the whole uh, 20 hour ordeal, which was our several flights home, because on one flight, uh, the people in front of me reclined, and so I quite literally didn't have the room to use my laptop. On the next flight, it was only about 45 minutes long, so I couldn't do it then. Um, and then on the one after that, the people were reclining again! <laughs> so I couldn't do it. Um, but it's okay. I got home, and I, I finished it. And it's, it's done now. And I'm just so glad I got it finished in time for Halloween. Um, I hope I can work with Daniel again because this story was really great. Maybe on something a little shorter that I could put more production value into that doesn't just so happen to coincide with my computer breaking and going on a trip and it being super hectic. But I really like this series despite all of that. <laughs> I thought the concept was really cool, and I hope we get to see more of Twin Pines soon. I hope you all enjoyed, and I hope you all have a happy Halloween.